Bro, I am gonna get crucified for this video. It kind of baffles me how Avatar The Last Airbender is widely considered by most, myself included, to be the best animated show of all time. Yet its sequel series is one of the most divisive shows among the cartoon community and is heralded by some as worthless garbage. I don't know how we got to this point as a society, but it seems to be the popular narrative at this point that The Legend of Korra is somehow a bad show, when in reality it's better than most animated shows out there, but whatever, we've gotten to the point where this video needed to be made. I'm just gonna say it bluntly, there is no legitimate reason to hate this show as intently as some people do, since most arguments against it are either misinterpretations, straw man arguments, or are such minor issues that are blown completely out of proportion. Don't get me wrong, there are legitimate problems with this show. Not one person is denying that fact, but the issues that people present are often overblown to make it look way worse than it actually is. I've said it before on this channel and I'll say it again, but the people who don't like The Legend of Korra, or the people who don't understand it, are so biased against it that they refuse to acknowledge anything that it does well, or are mad that it's not just a complete rehash of Avatar. You're completely free to dislike the show, but just because you dislike it doesn't make it an objectively bad garbage show. I like to keep Avatar Month as positive as I can because it's supposed to be a celebration of the series, but I think it's high time people started treating The Legend of Korra with that same respect. So today, I'm going full gamer rage mode, alright? Today, much like I did with Ash Ketchum, I am pulling no punches against this ignorance that plagues the community regarding The Legend of Korra. I'm your host, Matt CMG. Smash that motherfucking like button. Let's get weird. Let's get wild, and let's get right in to defending the legend of Korra. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna go point by point just like we did in Ash Ketchum Part 2. I'll be taking the most common and the dumbest criticisms of the series from various threads and videos from across the internet and debunking them to the highest possible degree using the rules of storytelling and character writing and my unhealthily immense knowledge of the Avatar universe. This is not going to be a direct response to anybody in particular. If you want something like that, then I recommend you go check out the Admiral's analysis. He has a four part series doing exactly that. But this video is going to be as general as I can make it for the sake of brevity. Again, this isn't to persuade you to like The Legend of Korra. If you dislike it, then you dislike it. That's that's fine. You, you're, it's going to be like that regardless. But what this video is setting out to do is to prove that most of the criticisms of the show are nitpicking non-issues and that this is objectively a great show and does not deserve to be called garbage, worthless, or anything like that. Let's get into it. You are the Avatar. I don't know what that is. So I kind of talked about this last year in my core is a good character video, but there's a lot of stuff in that video that I left out for the sake of brevity that I feel really needs to be said. For this section, I'm going to debunk every criticism relating to Korra as a character that I didn't already talk about in last year's Korra video. Some of these criticisms include that she's a Mary Sue, that she was made brown, bisexual, and female for the sake of diversity and nothing more, and that she's just some bratty kid and never changed or developed through the series. I already kind of touched on that last one in last year's video a little bit, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth, and today we're going to focus on these particular three criticisms, and we're gonna start in backwards order because why not? This idea that Korra's entire character could be boiled down to being just some bratty, impatient kid is disingenuous at best, since anyone who has seen the show cannot reasonably think this. These people are technically right, but only for season one, which a ton of people seem to focus on when calling the show worthless trash, even though there's three other seasons, but whatever, we'll get to that eventually. Any character writer will tell you that every character arc starts with the character having a faulty view of the world or of themselves, or in simpler terms, they believe a lie about either the world or themselves, and they learn the truth to that lie over the course of the story. Korra's lie that she believes, or at least one of them, is that as the Avatar, it is her duty to beat up bad guys and basically be our idea of a generic superhero, when that is not the case at all. The Avatar's job is to be a spiritual leader, to keep the world in balance, to serve as an arbiter of peace for all nations. She doesn't know any of this at first, and as a result, is not prepared for it, which is what starts her character arc. This is what changes her ideology and shifts her away from this lie that she originally believes. I'll agree that she's a tad unlikable in the first season, but what people don't realize is that she's supposed to be like that in the beginning so that you feel a sense of satisfaction when she finally does change her ways by the end of the season. Imagine if people said the same thing about Zuko, for instance, right? You could say, oh, he's just some angry brute who wants his honor back and treat him like that's all he is for the entire series. But to do so would be to disregard all the complexities to his character that develop or are revealed along the way and is completely missing the point of a positive change character arc. You can't praise Zuko for doing 
Magnus while hating on Korra for doing the same exact thing. Obviously, their arcs are different, but you get my you get my gist. You cannot boil a character down to just be what they are in the beginning and treat them like that's what they are for the whole series. Since if you were to do that, you are disregarding the entire point of the story. And the point of any story is to see our characters change and grow. So sure, Korra is an impatient, impulsive, bratty teenager in the first season, but as the series progresses, she changes drastically and is almost unrecognizable by the end, and many people don't bother to acknowledge this. In fact, just to prove that she's changed, let's compare Season 4 Korra to Season 1 Korra. Season 1 Korra would never have been able to do the things that she does later in the series because her mindset would not have been prepared to deal with any of it. When Korra defeats Kuvira and lets her live at the end of the series, she is showing great compassion and understanding of others that she learned along the way. If Season 1 Korra were in this situation, she would have beat the fucking shit out of her. If Korra didn't change it all throughout the series, then why did the former happen, but the latter didn't? It's because she grew as a character, and that's kind of the fucking point. Fighting is something the old me would do, but that always made things worse. Let me talk with Kovira. Hell, in season one alone, she changes a fuck ton. She starts off in episode one being impatient, jumping into fights and having no spiritual connection at all, to being a patient person, learning when not to fight, and was able to connect to her past lives long before Aang restored her bending. The character growth is there, anyone who says it isn't is literally wrong. For the second point, I'm gonna try to stay apolitical here, but I have seen, albeit rarely, it's still enough for me to address it, people who claim that Korra only exists to further some sort of diversity agenda for the leftist SJWs and all that kind of headassery. This is in regards to her being a girl, to her being a person of color, and to her being bisexual. Starting to sound like every Lily Singh joke out here, am I, am I, am I right? Haha, <laughs> fuck you. Starting off with her being a girl, this one is pretty easily debunked. You realize there could be female avatars too, right? Do the, do the words Avatar Kyoshi ring a bell? Uh, Avatar Yang Chen, perhaps? Even so, Mike and Brian have discussed Korra's creation in interviews a lot, and every single time, they tell the same story where one of them said, hey, what if we made this character a girl? And the other one said, Okay, it's not that complicated. There's no agenda pushing to be found here. If you have a problem with a female protagonist, chances are you've, you got a, you got other problems to deal with, buddy. As for her having a darker skin tone, this is not only very easily explained with in-universe reasons, but it's not even something that's central to her character and is never even brought up in the show. We know how the Avatar cycle works. We know that after Aang, we needed a Water Tribe Avatar, so this character had to be brown anyways. Look at almost any Water Tribe character in the original series, and you'll find that all, if not most of them, are clearly of a darker skin color. As for Korra being by bisexual. I did a whole video on that years ago, but to summarize, she was shown being bisexual for a total of like one minute at the very end of the series, nor was her sexuality even remotely related to her arc in any capacity. So this is really a non-issue, just like the rest of these. Again, I only see these things posted rarely, but if you do happen to be one of these people who thinks this unironically, then do us all a favor and fuck off. We don't want bigots in, this, in the Avatar community, and we especially don't want any fucking halfwits. And speaking of halfwits, let's talk about arguably the biggest buzzword in entertainment discourse today, the Mary Sue. This is a term that so many people use incorrectly because it's thrown around so liberally without any regard for what it actually means. A Mary Sue is defined as, quote, a type of female character who is depicted as unrealistically lacking in flaws or weaknesses. And the fact that some people can see this definition, watch the show, and apply it to Korra is baffling, to say the least. I, I genuinely can't even fathom the mental gymnastics necessary to see a character who does nothing but struggle and earn her victories and say, yeah, that's a Mary Sue. In case you are one of these Nimrods, however, allow me to explain. Let's take a look through the series and compare the things Korra does to this definition of Mary Sue. Let's start from episode one, which I think a lot of people have the most problems with in regards to this. Korra is shown to be able to bend three of the four elements at a very young age and over the course of about 13 years is trained in each bending style, making her a bending prodigy. While improbable, this is something that is central to Korra's character growth as the season progresses. It establishes that she is good at bending and values it greatly, and considering this is the introduction to the premise of her arc for the season, you need to suspend any disbelief. The same way you have to suspend your disbelief that Aang was frozen for a hundred years and came out unharmed, and was the youngest airbending master in history at age 12. It's called establishing a character and the premise. We talked about this in last year's Korra is a good character video, but I'll talk about this more in depth a bit later in the video. Moving on, we later see Korra subdue a group of triple threat triads of being arrested and reprimanded for it, showing us that her actions were not the best decision, and showing that she has flaws in her judgment. Mary Sue's are known for always being right and never making mistakes, yet right from the get-go, we see Korra make a mistake, we also see her make mistakes when going up against Tarlac's task force, putting Mako in danger with Amon, and just to name a few, and those are just in the first season. Her making mistakes is kind of the point, since she learns from them by the end of the season. You know, she deals with the consequences of her actions. Another common trait of Mary Sue's that people apply to Korra is that everyone else immediately likes her for no 
no discernible reason. Yet this is wrong, because Korra has plenty of enemies that aren't the main villain. These are people who don't actively try to kill her or anything like that, they just don't like her. And we can see this with characters like Lin, the equalist protesters, not to be confused with the chi blockers, the Southern Water Tribe citizens don't like her for not taking sides, President Raiko almost always opposes Korra, the Earth Queen straight up doesn't respect her, and even the spirits aren't too fond of her. Point is, she's far from being a person everyone likes for no reason. She also doesn't always win like many Mary Sues do. In fact, we see many times throughout Season 1 and the series as a whole, moments where Korra is vulnerable, in despair, in distress, needing to be saved, and straight up defeated. All things that Mary Sues do not do. We've seen her weak after escaping Tarlac's prison, hopeless that she had split from Rava, needing to be saved after fighting Zaheer, and the first fucking half of Season 4 was Korra being straight up depressed and suffering from PTSD. Yet people call her an infallible character. Actually, fucking unbelievable. If you somehow think Korra is a Mary Sue, you're straight up wrong. And if you thought I was done, you're also dead wrong. Because the absolute worst criticism labeling Korra as a Mary Sue is when people say that she was handed everything on a silver platter when it's literally factually incorrect on most occasions. The only time I can maybe understand this is the end of season one where she gets her bending given back to her, but even then, there was a character growth related reason for it, and it was relevant in the next season. If you look at all of Korra's quote-unquote power-ups, it's fairly obvious that she earned almost all of them. I explained her airbending in last year's video, but the short of it is that her struggle throughout the season to learn airbending was caused by fear, and she was able to airbend when she overcame that fear. Her spirit kaiju in season two was dumb, but it was an ability she already had in energy bending with a power boost from the spiritual energy of the Tree of Time. And this was done without the help of Rava. This was her own spirit. Regaining her connection to Rava was a result of accepting what Zaheer did to her after struggling for half a season to use the Avatar State. None of these things were easy to do, many of them taking parts of a season or an entire season to achieve. Meanwhile, Aang over here went on a full spiritual journey to access the Avatar State in a day or two, not to mention that he was straight up given energy bending and used it with no prior training. Compare that to Korra, who took years to achieve that same thing, and you've got a character who is way more realistic. That's not to say Aang is a bad character, he certainly isn't, but you can't claim that Korra Korra was handed things when not only is that not true, but Aang was handed way more than Korra ever was, i.e. the Lion Turtle. If you're gonna fault Korra for that, then you have to fault Aang for doing the same thing. But people won't do that, which shows the clear double standard people have for these two shows, but I will get to that later. Korra is not a Mary Sue, plain and fucking simple, because she does not fit the definition at any point. But we're still a team! The new Team Avatar! We got your back, Korra. Aside from Korra, I've seen plenty of gripes with the other characters of the main cast, and I think the three that get the brunt of it are Mako, Bolin, and Asami, and in some cases, rightfully so. There are certainly points where these characters aren't utilized very well or don't have a lot going on. You know, this is something that I have agreed with in the past. I've made videos about this kind of thing before, but I no longer really 100% agree with that. These characters are by no means perfect at all, but they each serve specific purposes, and some have very subtle arcs that I feel a lot of people don't notice or talk about. Let's start with Bolin, who from what I've seen gets the least shit from people. Bolin is seen by many as just a discount Sokka. He's a character who deals with his own insecurities while also being the comic relief character. It's a fair comparison, but that's about as far as it goes in my opinion. Sometimes he fits the role of the comic relief, other times he's the dynamic ally, and he works in both of those roles because he's funny in a very awkward way, but is also very trusting and loyal to his friends. Both his comedic moments and his more serious moments work because of the fact that the character is so genuine and honest with everyone. The comedy comes from when he tries to not be that, and even when he isn't. And his more emotional moments work because you know he's not just saying things to say them. He actually means what he says. For example, look at season 4 where he apologizes to Opal. It's a genuinely heartfelt scene, and it only works because Bolin is such a genuine character. Again, it seems to me that Bolin is one of the characters that naysayers hate the least, but I figured I'd address it here. Next, let's look at Asami. Let's be real. Asami in season 1 was literally just a means to an end, in the sense that she was only really kept around because the writers liked her, so they kind of forced her into a love triangle subplot with Korra and Mako in the latter half of the season. She had a little bit going on in season 1 with realizing that her father was working with the Equalists and all that, and this carries over into season 2 with her trying to keep her company afloat. Other than that though, she really doesn't do much or have much of an arc. Much like in season 1, Asami in season 2 really only existed to give Korra and Mako some unnecessary relationship trouble. She had her place in these seasons, don't get me wrong, but she was mostly an unnecessary addition. However, what I feel Asami doesn't get enough credit for are the roles she plays in seasons 3 and 4. She is much better utilized in these seasons, and it's because they use her to give us insight into what our main character is feeling. At the start of Season 3, we see Asami and Korra have formed a friendship that is maintained for the remainder of the series, and the writers use this as an opportunity for Korra to have a friend that she can bounce ideas off of. They do this by pairing the two up in these dynamic duo-type 
situations and having scenes of the two just talking. Her presence clearly serves a purpose here, and an important one at that. In seasons 3 and 4, Asami fits the role of the confidant. It's always important for your main character to have someone to confide in, and though Korra has had that in other characters such as Tenzin, it's also important for her to have a character who's more of a peer, someone who she can relate to on a more casual level. Asami doesn't do much in these seasons, much like the previous two, but the difference here is that she has a purpose for being injected into the story. In season 4, she even gets her own subplot, which isn't focused on too heavily, but still does a good job at further humanizing her and wrapping up the things that they set up in the first season. Lastly, let's look at Mako. I've been guilty of shitting all over this character in the past, and honestly, I don't know that I 100% agree with that stance anymore, because after looking at it a little bit more objectively, there's actually a lot more to appreciate about the character than I initially thought. My problem, and I think a lot of other people's problem with Mako, was that he was boring. He didn't do a whole hell of a lot past season 1, his presence in the first two seasons was to be Korra's love interest and nothing more, and he was barely in the last two seasons, especially season 4, they did him really fucking dirty there. Aside from not doing much, he also didn't have any noticeable character growth until the final season. However, this character growth, while originally a negative for me, is actually an arc that I found myself enjoying despite how subtle it is. After the events of seasons 1 and 2 with Mako dating Asami, then Korra, then Asami again, then Korra again, Mako goes into season 3 single and on weird terms with the ladies. They don't hold anything against him, but he's super awkward around them because he's obviously dated both of them before, so it's very uncomfortable for him. As a defense mechanism, Mako essentially becomes a stiff. He's platonic friends with both of them, but he doesn't want to show it, so he treats them as almost business partners and nothing more. This is brought up near the end of the season where Mako and Bolin's grandmother has that exchange with Korra and Asami at the Oasis, but it's pretty short. Fast forward to the final episode at Varric and Julie's wedding, and Mako tells Korra this. I want you to know, I'll follow you into battle no matter how crazy things get. I've got your back. And I always will. Which I think shows great growth for the character. He learned that he was being irrational and thinking that there was anything weird between him and his exes, and he finally accepts that at the end of the series, accepting that it's okay to have a platonic friendship with them. My only problem with this is that they didn't do a whole lot to show it, and Mako in general was sidelined for most of the final season, but other than that, this is subtle and effective character growth. At the end of the day though, what I say about these characters probably won't sway anybody. Much like the show itself, these characters have their flaws in the way they were written, but the shit all over them for those flaws is to ignore all the well-written parts about them. Too many people like to oversimplify these characters as the funny guy or the love interest. They're way more complex than that. As we'll see once we get into the... Hey guys, I'm totally in for taking out Bolin. He's way too powerful and awesome. I think that even among people who despise the Legend of Korra, many of them tend to agree that the villains are super well written and super well made. However, I've seen a ton of people completely misinterpret what the villains are made to represent, and it's those misinterpretations that make people hate them and thereby the show. Because as I've said before, and I'll say it again, they hate it because they don't understand it. As you'll see with all of these villains, one thing that they all have in common is this. They all start off with good intentions, and what they stand for is a universally good thing, but the way they go about achieving those things is the wrong way to do it, thereby making them villains. Going in chronological order, let's start with Aman. It's clear to anyone that Aman is supposed to represent the faults in the human concept of equality, and some go as far to say communism, though there are issues with comparing him to the latter. It's clear to anyone, though, that Aman stands for equality. He wants benders and non-benders to be equal, which is not a bad thing. The thing that makes him a villain is that he manufactured outrage to get non-benders to join his cult, committed literal acts of terrorism against Republic City, and did both of those things under a false identity that killed his entire movement once revealed. The problem with Aman is that you cannot achieve true equality by oppressing others. He made the non-benders think that they were being oppressed by the benders, and whether or not that was actually true, you wouldn't solve that problem by taking out the benders. You solve it by both sides compromising. This might get a little racy, especially given recent events, but I don't think I'm saying saying anything radical when I say this, but a good base level, and I repeat, base level comparison to Oman is the civil rights movement of the 1960s. African Americans wanted the same rights as white people, and they mostly went about doing so in peaceful ways. Of course, that's leaving out a ton of real conspiracies, riots, and other shit, but the point is, black people did not achieve civil rights by removing all the white people. They came to a compromise which was sorted out legally in the form of legislation. Oman is basically doing the opposite. Instead of taking his gripes to the Republic City Council or peacefully protesting with his supporters, he created a cult with the goal of removing benders from the equation entirely, and went about doing Doing so through terrorism. Whether or not the non-benders were actually being oppressed by benders is irrelevant because Aman made them think that they were even if they weren't. That's what makes him a villain and an interesting one at that considering how manipulative he is. A lot of people also seem to have missed the point of Aman being revealed as a bloodbender. They feel as though it came out of nowhere and that it defeats the purpose of his crusade against benders. What those people see as a negative however, I see as the point. Aman being revealed to be a bloodbender does make him a giant hypocrite, but those same people must have skipped the backstory episode because that episode pretty clearly outlines why 
why he's doing what he's doing. He saw the type of oppression that benders could inflict on non-benders by seeing his own abilities in action. He saw what bending could do to people in the wrong hands by discovering his father's identity as Yakon, and by using bloodbending himself. This was what warped him into the person that he became, a negative change arc, if you will. He wanted people to be equal, but his view of equality was a world where benders could not do what he can do, and I think this pretty much brings us full circle. Now let's get into Unalak. I'm not gonna go too in-depth with Unalak here, because many of the problems people have with him are fairly accurate, but that doesn't mean there aren't things to defend here. For me personally, I actually kind of like how Unalak starts off with a very noble goal, assuming he was being truthful this whole time, of wanting to peacefully reunite humans and spirits, which slowly transitions into a thirst for power that sends him into madness and eventually becoming the Dark Avatar. Like we said earlier, noble goal, horrible execution of said goal. Similarly to Amon, Unalak is very meticulous and manipulative, and you see it in every scene that he's in. He manipulates Korra into opening the spirit portals, he manipulates his brother and both water tribes into a civil war, he manipulates his own children into doing some pretty bad things, he holds Janora captive to get Korra to do what he wants, he manipulated harmonic convergence itself to merge with Vatu, you get the picture. He's a conniving villain with motivations that get progressively less noble as the season progresses, and I don't think that he gets enough credit for that. Next is Zaheer, and honestly, I think he's the best best villain because, acts of violence aside, he really wasn't a bad dude. Zaheer's goal was to achieve freedom for everybody, which if you're noticing the pattern here, isn't a bad thing to strive for. It was the killing of political leaders, sending a nation into disarray and anarchy, and attempting to end the Avatar cycle that made him a villain. He went so far down his own freedom rabbit hole that he dove into anarchy, but not in the way that you typically think of an anarchist. His thirst for freedom and disdain for oppressive governments became so one-sided for him that he eventually came to the conclusion that any government can become a and therefore can restrict freedoms at any time. So he saw it best to get rid of all governments so that can't happen. Freedom for all is a noble goal, but bringing about anarchy is a terrible execution of that goal. The problem with that being, of course, that what he wanted was a world without order, and the opposite of order is chaos, not freedom. He makes this all pretty clear in Season 3 Episode 9, so I'm gonna assume anyone who didn't understand this must have missed that episode. I also recommend checking out Hello Future Me's video about Zaheer wanting to kill the Avatar. It's a very good video. Moral of Zaheer's story, Freedom is a great thing and should be valued, but chaos is what happens when there is freedom without order. And lastly, we have Kuvira. With this power vacuum in the Earth Kingdom after the death of the Earth Queen, Kuvira set out to fill that vacuum and reunify her now fractured nation. The problem is that she did so by military force and intimidation, leading her to become a total dictator who got power hungry enough to start taking land that wasn't hers to take. Kuvira is a play on the term absolute power corrupts absolutely, and we can certainly see this throughout season 4. She is so devout to reunifying her nation that she believed the only way to do so was by military force. She is the opposite of Zaheer, and that Zaheer wanted freedom from oppressive governments, Kuvira was the oppressive government. Kuvira illustrates the very issues that Zaheer warned them about in the previous season, and shows the many issues that arise from military dictatorships. She had a vision to reunify her nation, but once that was completed, that suddenly wasn't enough for her. She became corrupted by the power that she had obtained through her crusade and the spirit cannon, and all that power became the arrogance that led to the attack on Republic City and her eventual fall from grace. I guess the point I've been trying to make here in regards to the villains is this. Just because you don't understand them or agree with their ideas, ideologies, that doesn't make them poor characters. It's not that they lack complexity, it's that you failed to see it, and a lot of the time, that's why people dislike these characters. They see that these characters stand for something and notice their hypocrisy, and try to spin that as a way to dislike the character, yet fail to realize that you're supposed to disagree with their methods, and you're supposed to notice their hypocrisy. Their ideologies are intentionally flawed. It's about opposites. See, I want the bad guy to be different than me so I know why I hate him. Combine that with oversimplifying them to the point of misrepresentation and you've got a textbook case for how to completely misinterpret a character. Sorry, what now? At the South Pole, there is a portal that connects our world to the spirit world. There's this major misconception in the Avatar community that The Legend of Korra's retcons somehow ruin the original series and create a ton of plot holes, and quite frankly, that's all bullshit. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that The Legend of Korra doesn't have retcons, because by definition, it certainly does. But these retcons are actually rather consistent with the original series, they don't create any major plot holes, and they by no means ruin either show. Some people make retcons out to be a bad thing inherently, like expanding on the lore somehow ruins the lore we already had, but that is just straight up wrong. If you explain the magic with more magic, then the magic is not lost. Even if The Legend of Korra's new bits of lore somehow did devalue or contradict the lore established by The Last Airbender, which it doesn't, it, it wouldn't matter, because the lore being inconsistent doesn't make the story automatically bad by proxy, as the storytelling itself is not affected by the lore's inconsistency. All of the lore that The Legend of Korra adds is not contradictory to The Last Airbender, and in some cases recontextualizes things and makes it better, but retcons 
don't make the show bad in any capacity. The first major retcon that I can think of is Rava. Rava was introduced in Season 2 as the Avatar's light spirit, the thing that makes the Avatar the Avatar. She gives each Avatar the ability to bend all four elements, enter the Avatar state, reincarnate, and is why the Avatar is considered the bridge between humans and spirits, because the Avatar is essentially part spirit. Not really, but more or less. This is a retcon for sure, since it's expanding on pre-established lore, yet some people seem to think that this contradicts The Last Airbender, which is not the case. In The Last Airbender, Bender, Avatar Roku explains that the Avatar state is quote, The Avatar state is a defense mechanism designed to empower you with the skills and knowledge of all the past avatars. Legend of Korra appears to contradict this by stating that the avatar state's power comes from Rava, but the vital mistake that a lot of people make is assuming that it must be one and not the other, but rarely do they consider that it's actually both, which is the case. The way Roku described the avatar state was vague enough to where it could be and was expanded upon. Recall that he says it empowers you with the quote, skills and knowledge of all past avatars, not necessarily their combined power, which is a common misconception. It's explained in the two-part episode Beginnings that Rava fusing with Wan was what gave him not only the ability to bend all four elements at the same time, but also gave him a considerable power boost without any other avatars before him, since he was the first. With that knowledge, it's fairly simple to figure out that Rava gives the power boost and the past avatars give the skills and knowledge. This works because Rava is the common denominator between all avatars, so she had a connection to their spirits, allowing the past avatars to channel their energy and knowledge to the current avatar, which is also why when Rava was destroyed, so was Korra's connection to her past lives, and when Rava was revived, those connections didn't come back because dying for even an instant severed those connections for good. Oh, oh, but how come Aang didn't know about Rava? He did, just not by name. In fact, Korra is the first avatar since Wan to have an actual dialogue with Rava while still alive, so it seems like an avatar doesn't really get to meet Rava until after they die. The avatar's spirit is actually mentioned in The Last Airbender, in Southern Air Temple, where when Aang lashes out after finding out about Monkey Anso's death, Katara refers to Aang's avatar spirit. It's his avatar spirit! showing that even common people knew about Rava, but her name seems to have been lost to time. Rava was always a thing. All the Legend of Korra did was give her a name, a backstory, and a direct purpose in the story. <laughs> Another retcon that people claims ruins The Last Airbender and therefore makes The Legend of Korra bad lies in the spirit portals. And I'm guessing that anybody who says this didn't watch the show at all since the spirit portals fit like a fucking Tetris piece into The Last Airbender's lore. But okay, let's hear them out. Why do people think this? Well, if the spirit portals were there the whole time, then why didn't Aang go to one during the Siege of the North or at any other point during the story to talk to Roku directly or to get help from the spirits or even to make his journey to the North Pole significantly easier? If you unironically think this, I have two questions for you. Did you watch The Legend of Korra and more importantly, did you watch The Last Airbender? Either you didn't watch them, or you did and weren't paying attention, because the reason these things didn't happen are obvious to anyone with half a fucking brain cell. Aang didn't use the spirit portals for several reasons outside of Mike and Brian not having thought of them yet at the time. The Legend of Korra explains that the spirit portals can only be opened by a fully realized avatar, which Aang certainly was not at the time since he couldn't control the avatar state, and that the portals can only be opened on the winter solstice, which at that point for Aang had already passed and the next one wouldn't have occurred until after the end of the series. Logistically speaking, Aang didn't even know about the spirit portal. So is this the way to the spirit world? And even if he did, he couldn't have gotten to the northern portal because of the blizzard and the bad battle taking place that would have taken priority. And even if he could physically get to the portal, he still couldn't open it, since he'd need to be able to go into the Avatar state on the solstice, and the stars just didn't align for that to happen. Again, this is a retcon, but it's not contradictory, and there are reasons for why it wasn't used in the past. This is probably the fucking most bogus shit I have ever heard in my life. Oh, oh, but in the last Airbender, you can't bend in the spirit world. Now they can, and this show fucking sucks. That's explained too, you fucking idiot, and you would have known that if you had paid any attention. You can't bend in the spirit world if you enter through meditation since you don't have your physical body. If you enter the spirit world physically through one of the portals, then you can bend since you are physically there. No body means no chi paths and therefore no bending. Get the fuck out of here with this weak ass bullshit. The spirit world itself is yet another supposed retcon, but it's really not. Some people think that what we saw of the spirit world in The Last Airbender is the extent to which it existed. It was just that swamp area with bizarre creatures running around. And for some reason to these people, The Legend of Korra expanding on the spirit world and showing more of it is somehow a contradiction. And I'm not sure how you could think that. You saw the spirit world like once, maybe twice in The Last Airbender, and nothing in those appearances set any rules that aren't followed in The Legend of Korra. All The Legend of Korra does is just add more areas and creature diversity to the spirit world, making it feel like another world and not just one singular location. Of all the supposed retcons, this is one that straight up isn't one. The origin of bending is something that is explained in both The Last Airbender
Airbender and the Legend of Korra, and to many fans, the two explanations are contradictory, even though they aren't when you use even the slightest bit of brain power. In the last Airbender, it's explained that people learned bending from the animals. Earthbenders learned from badger moles, firebenders from dragons, airbenders from the sky bison, and waterbenders from the moon. My, my favorite animal. The Legend of Korra seems to contradict this in the Avatar 1 episodes where we see that people were given these abilities by the lion turtles via energy bending. There are a few explanations here, and all of them work in tandem. Firstly, it's established in the last airbender that lion turtles have the ability to give people bending. The Legend of Korra just expanded upon that. Secondly, while it's true that benders learn from the animals, they didn't get the abilities from them. They got the ability to bend from the lion turtles who gave a bunch of people bending and then straight up dipped. And over time, the lion turtles and what they gave to people was forgotten about, lost to time, so people ended up creating legends such as the story of the Cave of Two Lovers to explain the first earthbenders. Much like how many mythologies and religious belief systems in real life have stories and legends to explain various aspects of human nature. The original benders were the animals and the moon in the sense that they were the first to do it naturally, whereas humans needed to be given the power. You also gotta remember that bending is a martial art more than it is a superpower. So when they say that they quote, learned to bend from the animals, they're referring to the martial arts techniques, the specific movements that make each bending style different. I was able to learn earth bending not just as a martial art. You know, just because you can shoot fire doesn't make you a true firebender. Much like how throwing a punch doesn't make you a fucking karate master. This is also mentioned in The Last Airbender where Katara doesn't claim to be a waterbender. You're a waterbender. Well, sort of. Not yet. We see this in Beginnings, where it was Wan who developed true firebending by watching the dragons, creating the dancing dragon technique. And after the lion turtles left, the benders of each nation eventually did the same by watching the animals and the moon, which over time became the bending disciplines that we know today. So just in case you're slow, lion turtles gave people bending, they said, I, I'ma head out. People developed martial arts using their respective element by watching their respective animal, and the true origins of bending were lost to time and relegated to legends. They got the ability to control the elements from the lion turtles, but learns to to bend from the animals. It's pro bending night in Republic City, and have we got a doozy for you? And speaking of bending, another thing that's kind of in retcon territory, but kind of not, is the way that bending works in the Legend of Korra. Specifically, with these side forms of bending that were considered rare in the last airbender, such as lightning bending, lava bending, metal bending, blood bending without a full moon, and the very controversial energy bending, as well as the idea that bending is somehow no longer sacred because it's being used for sport and the adoption of more modern fighting styles. People seem to think that these things being more common in the Legend of Korra somehow devalues them in The Last Airbender, or that they contradict it somehow, and that shit's just all bogus. We're gonna go through all of them. First up is lightning bending. People seem to think that bending lightning was some kind of rare ability, and it was, but not as rare as you'd think. According to Iroh in The Last Airbender, Only a select few firebenders can separate these energies. This creates an imbalance the energy wants to restore balance, and in the moment the positive and negative energy come crashing back together, you provide release and guidance, creating lightning. In other words, lightning bending can only be performed if one has a clear mind free of turmoil. The reason we don't see people doing it left and right in The Last Airbender is because not everyone has the ability to clear their mind easily. And there's also evidence to support the idea that, in Aang's time, the ability was only shared within members of the Fire Nation royal family, which explains why only Ozai, Iroh, and Azula knew about it and could use it. The reason Zuko couldn't do it was because his mind was full of inner conflict. After the Hundred Year War, there was a lot more cultural mixing between nations, and word of the lightning bending technique was spread around the world that even during the end of the Hundred Years' War, we see that people knew about it with the play on Ember Island featuring it. Knowledge of the technique spread, so more firebenders around the world were able to use it, since it was no longer a Fire Nation secret at that point. The reason Mako can do it is because he's always been considered calm in intense situations, and we don't even know anything about some of the background characters that are doing it, so we can't even say that they break the rules. As you'll see with many of these bending styles, it's perfectly reasonable that fighting styles and techniques would change and evolve over the 70-year gap between the two series. Next up, we got Lava Bending a technique that was once thought to be exclusive to avatars using both earth and fire bending. In The Legend of Korra, however, we learn that this is not the case, since both Bolin and Gazan are lava benders, proving that all it takes is an earth bender to bend lava. To some people, this is seen as some kind of inconsistency or another of Legend of Korra's series ruining retcons, when neither of these are the case. It's never said in The Last Airbender that bending lava is something only an avatar can do. The reason some people think that this is the case was because of a fact from Avatar Extra, a rebroadcast of the original series with little fact bubbles about the episodes 
cards popping up every now and again. One of these extras stated that lava bending was a combination of earth bending and fire bending, so many people assumed that only avatars could do it and ran with it. The problem with this is that the extras are largely considered by the community to be unreliable. Some of what is said in them is canon, but those ultimately boil down to slight disambiguations or clarifications, and have actually been wrong several times. This is largely because Mike and Brian didn't actually write these extras, they were actually written by staff writer Joshua Hamilton. Since these extras didn't come directly from Bryke, then their legitimacy should be questioned. Anyways, a lot of people for the longest time thought that lava bending was a combination of earth and fire bending, and we know now that that's not true. However, if we look into how bending works, lava bending makes perfect sense, and it certainly fits the characters who use it. Firstly, temperature manipulation is something common to all elements. Fire benders should be pretty obvious, and water benders can lower the temperature of their water to freeze it, so it stands to reason that the same applies to the other elements. Lava is literally just molten rock. It's earth that was heated enough to where it melts and becomes a liquid, so by virtue of lava being pure earth, it makes perfect sense that an earthbender should be able to bend it, and with enough training, can manipulate its temperature. Toph mentions that lava bending is a very rare ability, and I think I have an answer for why, though keep in mind that this is more of a theory than anything else. We all know that bending is genetic. Just look at Aang and Katara's kids. One came out an airbender, one got airbending later, and the other a waterbender. Also remember that nations had been ethnically separated for a very long time, so the reason you don't see an earthbender in the water tribe is because no earthbenders live there to pass on their ability. This all changed with Republic City, which is a melting pot of people from all nations, meaning more genetic diversity. Olin is the son of an Earth Kingdom citizen and a Fire Nation citizen, so he has both Earth and Firebender genetics. Since he's a regular human and not the Avatar, he can only bend one element, which happened to be Earth, yet he still has traits that you'd expect of a Firebender in heat manipulation, but it only applies to his Earthbending. I can't say the same for Gazan, since we don't know anything about his past, so it may also be chalked up to lava bending being something so exceptionally rare that only one or two people are born with it every so often, which would also explain why we didn't see any lava benders in The Last Airbender. Next, let's look at metal bending. I'm not really sure why some people have a problem with metal bending since it was explained in The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra doesn't contradict it in any way, but a lot of people seem to think that this is a rare ability much like lava bending, so it shouldn't make sense that so many people can use it. This was never said to be the case, and the abundance of metal benders has nothing to do with The Legend of Korra. In the Avatar comics, Toph starts the very first metal bending academy with just a few students, and it's implied that by the time of The Legend of Korra, she has expanded worldwide. This comic was made to connect the dots between the two series and is considered canon, so deal with that. I don't care if you don't like it, fuck you. Metal bending was also never stated in any canon medium to be any rare ability that only a select few can use, so I'm not sure where this idea is coming from. If Toph can invent the technique without any prior training, then it's perfectly reasonable for other earthbenders to do it too, since the basis of technique is to use Toph's vibrational sensing technique, which we've seen Aang is able to do, meaning anyone can do it. By the time of the Legend of Korra, they've also likely found an easier way than that to learn metal bending, allowing even more earthbenders to do it. Again, I'm not sure why this is an issue or how it devalues the last airbender, but I've seen it floating around, so figured I'd mention it. Now we get to the one that really got people in a tizzy, bloodbending without a full moon. This one seems to annoy people because, like a lot of things in this video, it seemed inconsistent with what was established in The Last Airbender, keyword there being seemed because this is not inconsistent. In The Last Airbender, it's established that bloodbending is a technique that waterbenders can only do with the power of the full moon. People who didn't pay attention think that this rule also applies to the three bloodbenders we see in The Legend of Korra when it's made pretty clear in the Amon flashback episode that Yakone was born with one of these mutations or rare abilities, with his being to bloodbend without a full moon. He, of course, passed this ability on to his kids Tarlock and Noatok slash Amon, and trained them in using it. Tarlock stopped practicing bloodbending when his brother ran away, which is why he has to physically move to use it, unlike his brother. And it's clear that intense training of this ability allowed Yakone and Amon to bloodbend people without moving, or at least not noticeably moving. The key difference between this and the rules established in The Last Airbender are that Amon and Yakone are established to be pretty clear exceptions to the rule. The reason we don't see bloodbending used more throughout The Legend of Korra is due to the limitations of the technique, with it being illegal in Republic City, and likely the rest of the world, and can only be done under a full moon, which is about three nights per month if we assume that the Avatar world has the same lunar cycle as Earth. Even if you want to argue that they shouldn't have included this mutation and made exceptions to the bloodbending rules, what purpose would limiting your villain serve? Wouldn't it be more threatening to have a villain who doesn't play by the rules, who can control you at literally any time, as opposed to three nights a month? They made Amon and his father the exceptions to the rules of bloodbending for dramatic effect. It increases tension. Another problem people have with bloodbending is 
is how Amon uses it to permanently take away other people's bending. Oh, oh this doesn't make sense. How does blunt people take people's bending away? That's dumb. So bad. Well, I'm glad you asked this question, my idiotic friend. So let's have a little lesson about chi and bending. In the Avatar world, chi is the energy source behind all bending. It's an energy that lives within every living being and is what allows benders to bend. As both the Guru and Iroh explain, chi flows throughout the body. And as demonstrated by Tai Li and the chi blockers, chi can be blocked physically. If you can block someone's chi from a hit in the right spot on the outside, then just imagine the kind of damage that can be done from the inside. Amon somehow found a way to physically and permanently block these chi paths from the inside using blood bending, preventing the bender from accessing their chi, therefore permanently removing the person's bending. It's never stated specifically how he's able to do this, but again, it's the kind of thing where it's explained just enough to where you can suspend your disbelief, which again, adds to the tension. It's scarier when you don't know how it works. And last but not least, we have energy bending, which is the ability to bend life energy itself and has only been used by avatars and lion turtles. Korra gains access to energy bending at the end of season one, but the extent to which she can use it is pretty limited, since at that point she could only restore people's bending that had been blocked by Amon, which makes perfect sense by the way, since life energy is more powerful than any physical block. In season two, she takes further advantage of this ability by using it to astral project her own spirit, not Rava, in the fight against Unavatu with a little power up from the Tree of Time. She used it twice in Season 4, first to free the souls of people taken into the spirit world by the spirit vines, and again at the end of the series where she blocks the spirit cannon, opening a new spirit portal. Of course, people think that this is all bullshit, though I find that a lot of the issues people have with it are narrative issues over logistical ones. Like, the logic behind energy bending was and has always been vague on purpose to keep the mysticism intact, so most don't seem to have a problem with it in that regard. The problems arise in how it's used, and apparently the Legend of Korra ruins it by expanding upon it. Start, start to see a little bit of a pattern here. Let's just get this out of the way. Energy bending has and will always be a deus ex machina. It was like that in The Last Airbender, and it's still like that in The Legend of Korra. People always bitch and moan about Korra getting her powers given to her, when Aang also did virtually the same thing, and it's not even limited to just energy bending, though we already talked about that earlier in the video, so let's stick to energy bending. I feel as though energy bending is the easiest form of bending to explain just by virtue of what it is. It's bending life energy, which is so fucking general that there are virtually no rules for it, and every time it is used in The Legend of Korra, its use is explained, and even if it's not explained directly, one can easily infer what is happening. For example, if you can use energy bending to take bending away, it stands to reason that you could use it to do the opposite. Need to commune with spirit pods? Energy bending. Want to stop a blast of literal spirit vine energy? energy bending. It's a technique that has always been there for plot convenience, but if anything, its continued use throughout The Legend of Korra made it a lot less contrived. Though I will say, kaiju of spirit energy? That might be where the line gets drawn if it hasn't been drawn already. The other major argument I see regarding bending is that the way The Legend of Korra uses it somehow devalues it, and that's fucking stupid, because nothing has really changed since The Last Airbender. Traditional martial arts are used less in favor of more modern fighting styles, but that doesn't make bending less valuable, since there's still a fair amount of traditional martial arts used in the series, and bending is still used in everyday society, but we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in another section. In fact, the mixing of bending styles was something that started in The Last Airbender, with Iroh's lightning redirection technique being based on water bending, and there are several scenes where characters use techniques of other bending styles. For example, in Katara's fight against Hama, instead of letting the water blast flow and redirecting it like was like is taught in water bending, like we see Paku doing here, she instead opts to stand her ground and break the blast head on, something that's more typical of earth bending that she probably learned from Toph. Katara, using an earth Earth bending technique with water bending doesn't devalue either style, and by that same logic, the MMA stuff that we see in The Legend of Korra doesn't either, especially when you consider that there are still people out there who use the traditional styles. Pro bending also seems to be a big point of contention in relation to this, and it's equally as dumb. People seem to think that bending shouldn't be used for sport like we see in pro bending, yet these people will disregard the fact that bending was used for sport all the fucking time in The Last Airbender. The Airbenders played airball, Fire Nation kids played hide and explode, Earthbenders had underground earthbending wrestling rings. Bending has always been used for sport, so The Legend of Korra doing it doesn't change a goddamn thing. Bending styles changing and evolving over time, something that should be expected, doesn't make The Legend of Korra bad. You're gonna have to hit me with something better than that, if you want me to believe you. He cannot destroy light any more than I can destroy darkness. Now let's move on to the miscellaneous section where I'll discuss anything that didn't fit into any other previous category. Firstly, let's talk about about Rava and Vatsu, the source of the worst misconception in Avatar history. There are actually a few misconceptions about these two, and the first is one that was popularized by Lily Orchard's video. I know I said I wouldn't be responding to anyone directly here, but I've only ever heard the God-Satan comparison from her and the people who watched her video, so it's mostly on her that this misconception exists. In her video, she claims that Rava and Vatsu are representations of God and Satan, therefore ruining the series with Western Judeo-Christian influences. And this is wrong on so many levels. First 
first of all, let's look at this logistically for a second, right? Mike and Brian and everybody else who worked on these shows are and have always been meticulous about how they incorporate Eastern philosophy into the Avatar world. Literally everything in The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra can be traced back to some East Asian philosophy, religion, or culture. So it literally makes no sense why they would suddenly incorporate Western philosophy into their show and into their world built on Eastern philosophy. Literally everything else is Asian inspired, so why would Mike and Brian do this? It's because they didn't. It's not that they're meant to represent God and Satan, it's that Lily Orchard failed to interpret them correctly and she peddled that to anyone who took her video seriously. Like, you guys you guys realize that embodiments of light and dark exist in religions other than Christianity, right? You might be saying right now, well if Rafa and Vatsu aren't God and Satan, what else can they be? Yin and Yang are already taken. And this right here is why this is the biggest misconception in Avatar history. While it's true that Tweet and La, the moon and ocean spirits exist in duality, they don't represent yin and yang. In fact, yin and yang and duality itself is a concept that can't be attributed to any one or two spirits in the Avatar universe. The only reason we see the yin and yang symbol in the episode is because of what Ko told Aang about duality. He never said that Tweet and La were the yin yang spirits, in fact they're directly stated to be the moon and ocean spirits specifically, but again, they exist in duality. Rava and Vatu are explicitly stated to be the spirits of light and darkness respectively, and the two exist in duality. Duality is a concept in so many world religions that is way more than just good and evil. The yin-yang duality can be attributed to a number of things such as good and evil, light and dark, push and pull, nature and infrastructure, tradition and modernity, right. chaos and harmony. You get the picture. While spirits like Twi and La and Rava and Vatu exist in a yin-yang duality, that's not what they explicitly represent and therefore the two pairs can coexist without any issue. Another thing a lot of people complain about is the setting of The Legend of Korra, specifically Republic City and the many technological advancements that have developed off-screen between the two series. In fact, I've seen people claim that this is The Legend of Korra's worst attribute, and let me just say, if that's the reason you think the show is trash, then you might be more weak-minded than I thought. To put it bluntly, these complaints about the setting are non-issues at best. For starters, Republic City is seen by some as just 1920s New York under the guise of they're Americanizing the series, which is straight up wrong. Republic City is partially based based on 1920s New York, but also cities like 1920s Hong Kong and Shanghai. It's more Asian inspired than it is American. If it's not the city with these people, it's the technology within it. Many will argue that technology does not belong in the Avatar world, so the inclusion of industrialization in The Legend of Korra is a bad thing to them, the main reason being that it takes away for the need for bending, which, as you could have guessed, isn't even true. Bending is still very much a necessity in Republic City, one example being how lightning benders provide power plants with electricity, or how the police use metal bending to subdue and restrain people aside from combat. Zhao Fu is a city run almost entirely by metal bending, and many rural towns that we see later in the series still use bending in everyday situations like we saw in the original series. This idea that industrialization somehow killed bending is straight up incorrect, and even if it was, I don't see how that makes the show automatically worse. The other point of contention is the fact that there's cars now, but I have absolutely no idea how that is a bad thing. Y'all seem to have conveniently forgotten about the fact that in The Last Airbender, the Fire Nation had steamboats, jet skis, tractors, tanks, airships, gondolas, but no, that's the, that's the Masterpiece series. We can't acknowledge that, but we'll still use this against the series we don't like. We'll just disregard the very real fact that this same technology from the original series would have evolved in the 70 years between the two as technology does in the real world. The drill is no more believable than the mecha tanks. Technology like that was a thing in The Last Airbender, so if you're going to fault Korra for having it, then you must fault its predecessor as well. But you shouldn't fault either of them though, because it's a fantasy world and they're allowed to have technology, especially fantastical technology. This is a non-issue. As I alluded to near the start of the video, let's talk about Korra's bending prowess. I didn't put this in the Korra section because I just couldn't find a way for it to fit and have the script flow, so I'm putting it in the miscellaneous section, so deal with it. One of the first scenes in the show shows Korra at age 4 bending water, earth, and fire, something that we've never seen an avatar do before. Korra is the first avatar, at least that we know of, that has been able to bend multiple elements before knowing their status as the avatar, which is usually age 16. People like to use this scene as another of Korra's definitive Mary Sue moments. Oh no, a child shot fire, the show is ruined, how can we possibly go on? Simply put, this is a very nitpicky criticism, and it doesn't make Korra a Mary Sue, since her skill in present day is very clearly attainable. Alongside what I said earlier about this ability being something that is central to Korra's arc regarding her identity, it's also very easily explained through in-universe logic. Simply put, the Avatar is inherently gifted at bending no matter which incarnation, so Korra's ability to bend multiple elements at such 
such a young age shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. And even if you want to say that it isn't possible and it's stupid, it still takes her 13 years to actually master these elements, passing her firebending exam at age 17. So she's had sufficient training in each of these elements. This is ultimately no different from Aang being the youngest airbending master in history at age 12, or the fact that he picked up waterbending in an afternoon and mastered it in a few months, unlocked earthbending in a day, and was given firebending by the dragons, neither of which he had mastered by the time he fought Ozai. I need more time to master firebending. And frankly, your earthbending could still use some work too. If anything, this shows that Aang took less time to master the elements than any other avatar, making Korra no different from other avatars in this regard. Point is, all avatars are inherently good at bending, but some avatars will be better than others. Again, this is one of the dumbest nitpicks, since this scene literally exists to set up the premise of the show and the premise of Korra's character arc for the series. Now let's address one of the biggest elephants in the room. Korasami. I made a video about this years ago, and looking back on it, it's not that great of a video because I kind of dodged a lot of pressing issues regarding the ship and was very weary about potentially offending people, but I no longer care about those things, and my opinion on Korasami has changed a bit since then anyways, so I might as well be as blunt as I can be here. To put things in the simplest way possible, Korasami makes sense from a writing perspective, but just barely because it was clearly very rushed. A lot of people say that this pairing came out of nowhere and just exists to bait the Tumblrites, but this is not true. Mike and Brian had the idea way back around Season 2, but didn't go about implementing it until late in Season 3, where you get a lot more scenes of Korra and Asami together. These scenes became a lot more romantic in nature in Season 4, where they established pretty clearly that the two have a deep connection from the time skip and have romantic feelings for each other with all the blushing and excessive niceties that go on throughout the season. Like it or not, it makes sense despite how rushed it is, and I'm sure Bright are aware of this because of how they're handling it in the Korra comic. You don't have to like the ship, but if your reason for disliking it is anything other than the way it was written, then you might just be a homophobe. The reason I say this is that whenever I see people try to rewrite the ending, they either do without Korasami completely, or they make Korra end up with Mako instead, which I think is pretty indicative of the fact that some of these people might subconsciously hate, hate the gays. gays. Like, if your issue was that they showed a non-explicit gay relationship for 30 seconds, then that's not the show's problem, that's a you problem. The relationship had almost zero bearing on the quality of the show as a whole, yet people make it out as one of its worst attributes which is incredibly fucking stupid. Let's see, let's see, what did I, what did I miss here? Uh, season 1 Love Triangle. Uh, it's, it's bad, but it doesn't really ruin the entire show or anything. Uh, losing connections to the past avatars, well, that had a pretty clear thematic relevance, so I don't really mind that. Zaheer flying, well, if a, if a 10 ton bison can use airbending to fly, then it stands the reason that a human can do it with enough training. Uh, I, I genuinely can't think of anything else. I think we've tackled every common criticism of the show, and many of them are nitpicks or failure to understand what the show directly explained. But this video ain't over yet, my friends. So let's get meta. Of all the avatars I've worked with, you're by far the worst. I know that's only one other avatar, but still. Yet another thing that people use to discredit the Legend of Korra are these unfair and sometimes straight up false comparisons to the last airbender that are used to not only make the Legend of Korra look bad, but also claiming that the Legend of Korra somehow destroyed Avatar The Last Airbender's legacy and ruins both shows in the process. And this kind of thinking is exaggeratory and dumb, and I will explain why. A lot of the anti Korra crowd seem to have this really fucking stupid double standard when it comes to the show's relation to its predecessor. Someone on a Reddit thread explained what I mean by this pretty precisely. Quote, it is fabricating a problem, and then, on top of that, fabricating a reason why The Last Airbender is exempt. Anytime The Legend of Korra does something different from The Last Airbender, they claim that it's trying too hard to be different, whatever that means, yet when it does things exactly as The Last Airbender did them, or references the events of The Last Airbender, it's seen as rehashing and nostalgia pandering, which I think is proof that you really can't win with these people. I honestly don't blame people for thinking this, because when The Legend of Korra first came out in 2012, it was hyped up as the next big thing, you know, this, this sequel to Avatar, which gave people these enormous expectations, and everyone tuned in, and many were subsequently disappointed because of how overhyped it was. The Last Airbender set the bar pretty high, and it took far too long for Korra to reach that bar. In terms of the show being different from The Last Airbender, though, I really don't see the problem. As a sequel series, The Legend of Korra is obligated to expand upon the foundations set by its predecessor, while also introducing new ideas and new situations to differentiate itself. They can't be trying too hard to be different when it didn't take much to differentiate the two to begin with. Being different and introducing new concepts is kind of the point of a sequel. 
sequel. However, The Legend of Korra is really only a sequel in name and in universe. It was always meant to be the story of the next Avatar. It's not a continuation of The Last Airbender. That story is over and doesn't need a continuation, comics aside. The Legend of Korra exists in this weird state of being its own thing while also being a sequel, kind of like a JoJo part. And that's probably the best way they could have gone about it. And I don't know what it is about Korra haters when they say that it ruined the legacy of the original, uh, but it's fucking stupid. Firstly, you don't even really need to watch The Last Airbender to understand The Legend of Korra, since it reintroduces the necessary concepts and the premise is explained in the intro of every episode. The first episode of the show even has a pretty concise recap of The Last Airbender by telling us what happened in Aang's time and the effects that those events have on the world currently. There are really only a few moments in The Legend of Korra that don't work if you haven't seen The Last Airbender, namely Toph's appearance in Season 4 and a few minor explainers throughout the series. But even then, you can get the gist of those scenes. When it comes to legacy, however, I don't see how The Legend of Korra could have destroyed it since it is very careful and respectful when it directly references or pays homage to The Last Airbender. When it bends the rules, it does so in a way that doesn't contradict or demean what was already established as we discussed earlier with the retcons. And considering most of the original cast is either barely in The Legend of Korra or not in it at all, it's actually very improbable that their legacies, their stories, or their characters could have been destroyed. For instance, Toph is the one character from the original gang that we see the most in The Legend of Korra, and personality-wise, she is mostly the same, just a little bit wiser from age, and I'd hardly call that a destruction of her legacy. Katara and Zuko are the other two that are still alive, but they aren't in The Legend of Korra enough for it to destroy their characters, and even if Legend of Korra did do that, they aren't even central characters anymore. Their stories are done. From what Kaya, Bumi, and Tenzin say about Aang, he doesn't seem to have changed much after the series. We discussed this in a previous video. Sokka is really the only grounds for claiming the show disrespected the original, since Sokka is hardly even mentioned past season 1, but even then, what we do see and hear of him is pretty consistent from where he left off in The Last Airbender. I guess my point here is that claiming a sequel disrespects the legacy of the original is a very bold statement that doesn't really apply in this instance. You could certainly say that for a slew of sequels or reboots out there, but The Legend of Korra ain't one of them. In fact, even if The Legend of Korra was the worst show ever made, which it isn't, it still would not destroy the legacy of Avatar The Last Airbender. As cringe as this is gonna sound, I think Nostalgia Critic put it best in his Last Airbender movie review. So you can do whatever you want to the franchise, because no matter what, nothing can take away or make any better what's already perfect. You know, I'm just I'm just as surprised as you that something this profound came from Doug Walker, but it's very true. Cringe. <laughs> Neither show is perfect, but The Last Airbender is The Last Airbender, and The Legend of Korra is The Legend of Korra, and the quality of one does not affect the quality of the other. The original can still exist in a vacuum, and you can revisit it at any time, and it'll still be the same whether you like The Legend of Korra or not. Korra's existence only affects The Last Airbenders if you let it. At the end of the day though, it's clear what a lot of people wanted. They didn't want The Legend of Korra to be The Legend of Korra, they wanted The Legend of Korra to be Avatar 2, and this is evident by this really dumb double standard. I've seen a bunch of people in my comments section and even around the internet who try to rewrite The Legend of Korra, yet almost every time they just retread ground that was already covered in The Last Airbender. For instance, I've seen rewrites of this show that make it so Korra doesn't get her bending back at the end of season 1. Okay, fair enough. So to regain it, she goes on a journey around the world to relearn them by opening her chakras. Sound familiar? Because that's exactly what happened to The Last Airbender. Oh, by the way, side tangent, opening the chakras is not the only way to achieve the Avatar state. And the fact that people think this is a huge misconception. It's not a requirement. But anyways, these people seem to think that by doing exactly what Avatar did, again, that it would make Legend of Korra inherently good, and therefore what we got was bad but that's not how that works. People think that rehashing the story for the sequel would make the sequel good, when that's not the case. The story of Avatar worked because it was specifically crafted to be that way. The story was written specifically to work with the characters that they needed to develop. You can't just take the exact same story and put it into another show with different characters, because it's not gonna work, especially if that show happens to be the sequel. Imagine for a second if The Legend of Korra started out with Korra as only a waterbender, so throughout the series she travels around the world learning earth, fire, air, etc. On a base level, this doesn't work, because we've pretty much already seen this with The Last Airbender. Obviously, you can change things around to make it more interesting, you know, Pokemon's been doing that same shit for years, but ultimately, you're just retreading the same ground. The Legend of Korra would be boring if it was the exact same as The Last Airbender, and if anything, that's more of a reason to enjoy it. A ton of people like to rag on this show for it being different, but honestly, The Legend of Korra is at its best 
when it does new things. And since I know some people are going to use this section to call me a hypocrite, let me just say this. It's impossible to not compare the two series. Hell, I've done it in this video and other videos multiple times. It's okay to do so as long as the comparison is fair. If we're talking about the lore of the Avatar universe or a situation like our protagonist getting handed powers, for example, then I'd say that those are fair comparisons. What isn't a fair comparison is when you take two things with completely different contexts and try to equate them, when the differences are clearly a result of those differing contexts. You've probably seen what I mean throughout this video, and I think there are often many instances where these false comparisons are used to discredit the Legend of Korra unfairly when criticisms like those are typically pretty disingenuous. Like I said, there are fair comparisons to be made, but the unfair ones disregard the context, which is yet another example of what I said at the beginning of this section. It's fabricating a problem, and then fabricating a reason for why The Last Airbender is exempt. You see what I did there? I put a sock in it. Literally. Remember at the remember at the start of this video when I said this video wasn't going to be a direct response to anybody in particular? Well, here's the part where we roast those videos, and I tell you why they're fucking awful. There's two major videos that I really want to hit on here, and I think you probably already know what they are. Starting off, The Legend of Korra is Garbage and Here's Why by Lily Orchard is probably the most popular of these videos, and it's pretty fucking bad. The entire video is filled with tiny nitpicks that ultimately don't mean anything, terrible interpretations and misrepresentations of the characters, tons of false comparisons to The Last Airbender, and a multitude of blanket statements that she never backs up. In fact, at the start of her video, she claims that she will be, quote, nitpicking every tiny detail, which already tells you that this isn't going to be a good review, since nitpicks don't actually matter in the grand scheme of things. That's why they're called nitpicks. The definition of nitpicking is looking for small or unimportant errors or faults, especially in order to criticize unnecessarily. In other words, she's making mountains out of badger molehills with almost every argument. And this way of thinking has spread throughout the fandom. We already kind of talked about the uh, Rava and Vatu are God and Satan garbage, but that's yet another really bad argument, since even if they were meant to be God and Satan, which they aren't, that doesn't somehow make the show automatically worse. I, I don't understand that way of, way of thinking. She also seems to inject a lot of her own personal political ideologies into the video, which is totally fine, but it takes away from the fact that a review is supposed to be about the quality of the thing that you're reviewing, not about whether or not you agree with what it's saying. I think the worst thing about this video, though, is that it's long and people just assume that it's right because it's long. This is how Lily Orchard gets away with making these ridiculously bold blanket statements in the beginning of her video and then never elaborating on them. For example, near the start of the video she claims Korra is a terrible character and she gets worse. Yet at no point in the video does she elaborate on why she thinks this or how Korra gets worse. She makes this claim at the start of the video, hinting at the fact that she'll explain later, yet most people probably won't make it far enough in the video because it's so long, so they just agree with the opening statement without actually hearing what she has to say in the rest of the video, even though if you actually watch the video, she never actually explains it. You know, how do you, how do you expect me to take you seriously if you never back up what you're saying? It's also fairly clear that Lily Orchard seems to think that adding new lore to the series is done as a way to avoid actual storytelling, which is so unbelievably wrong and misses the point so fucking hard that it actually baffles me how people consider her a valid critic. This video is an awful analysis of The Legend of Korra, and though I agree with maybe like two things throughout the entire video, the majority of it seems like she's just looking for any reason to lambast the show, and very unfairly at that. You know, I totally get it. Reviews are inherently opinionated, but you have to include some kind of objectivity in there for people to actually take you seriously. If you guys want a point-by-point -point debunk of her video, then go check out the Admiral's analysis. He has a great four-part series debunking this video point-by-point, -point. and biases aside, I think it's quite fair, and I'm not just saying that because I used one of my clips in one of his parts. Bro, listen, right? Not only did this dude prove Lily Orchard wrong with facts and evidence from the show? But he proved her wrong mathematically, my dude. It's insane. Like, he literally did the math and proved that literally half of Lily Orchard's video is literally just straight up falsehoods and lies. It's, it's insane. It's a great video series. Go check it out. It's a good series. Go watch. The other notable video series unjustly shitting on The Legend of Korra is The Legend of Horra series by ER, and they are equally as terrible. I'm gonna try to avoid a point-by-point -point rebuttal. This video is long enough, and that's a video for somebody else to make, but I will do an overview of each part of his four-part series and tell you why it's bad. First off, ER spends most of his time making jokes and using those jokes to distract you from the fact that he never actually explains some of the things that he says. Humor in reviews is completely fine. In fact, I found some of ER's jokes to be pretty funny, even though I think he's just some edgy chud. But when you use those jokes to distract from the central points of the video, 
then you're using humor wrong. In part one alone, ER spends the first 10 minutes of the video setting up the premise of his review series by just saying Korra bad in different ways, never explaining it, mindlessly praising The Last Airbender, and follows all of that up with three straight minutes of a joke that goes on for way too long before getting into any of his actual points. Five minutes into part one, and he actually just straight up admits he's extremely biased against Legend of Korra and towards The Last Airbender, so I guess that's off to a great start. At least he admits that he's incredibly biased against this show. It takes literally half the video to get into it, and once we do get into it, his points aren't even that good. The entirety of part one is more pointless nitpicking of flaws that by no means ruin the show, almost all of which I already debunked earlier in this video. For example, here's one that I didn't actually touch on. He tries to use the existence of Sky Bison against the show, even though the show explained how that's possible in season two, and it's a terrible point if, if he meant it seriously. Part two is a little bit better than part one, but not by much. He continues to unfairly nitpick tiny details and blow them out of proportion, and he makes huge logical leaps while also making no effort to actually understand what the show was going for and what it was trying to say. Like, there are multiple times in this video where ER literally explains the point of something, such as the hypocrisy of the equalists, yet somehow still misses that point and pins it on bad writing, even though it was done that way intentionally. That was the point. Lily Orchard also does the same thing a lot in her videos, so I'm starting to sense a pattern in that regard. He also takes a lot of jabs at Bryk in this series, which isn't good. You know, I don't I don't agree with the idea that people should be worshipping them as gods, of course, that's fucking stupid, but a good rule of thumb for reviewing anything is to criticize the writing, not the writers. Criticizing the writers as people is, is, is kind of just deflecting from the point, if you ask me. There is one point that he makes in part two that I kind of agree with, where he digs into the season one love triangle, and I think that even people who like The Legend of Korra would probably agree with him in this, but the way he explains it is with more comparisons to The Last Airbender and thinly veiled misogyny at worst, though I will give him the benefit of the doubt on the latter. He dedicates the last seven minutes or so of part two to deconstructing how blood bending should have been energy bending, and it's a decent point slash rewrite, but it's still mostly a nitpick. Moving on to part three, ER spends most of the video further deconstructing Amon and his motivations, and I think he makes a fair point in saying that Amon's motivation was kind of contrived, even though it's pretty clear to me at least what they were going for, as I explained earlier in the villains section. He then tries to criticize the ending where Korra gets her bending back, but he does a terrible terrible fucking job at it. Like, there are a ton of valid criticisms to be made here in regards to this scene, ones that fans and haters alike have made and agree with, yet he makes none of those. He literally just says, uh, uh, magic make no sense, Korra bad character, and he, and he calls it a day. Part four is the final part of his series, and it's probably the worst of them. He starts this one off by directly insulting the fan base, or rather what he perceives to be the fan base, and writing them off as stupid SJW Tumblrite libtards, and, and it's fucking terrible. You're not gonna persuade anyone through ad hominems, my guy. He also debunks the it's just a kid's show excuse, which I actually kind of agree with. I've said it before on this channel, and I'll say it again, but The Legend of Korra and The Last Airbender, for that matter, are not kid shows. They're just shows that happen to be mostly kid-friendly, and they happen to air on a children's network. Saying it's a kid show isn't a valid excuse for the quality of writing in any show, and if you've seen my Defending Ash Ketchum videos, then you'll know that I'm actually rather consistent with that. But anyways, he does the typical Korra had no character development bullshit Shit. And if you notice, he only uses clips from season one to demonstrate that. And as we said earlier, Korra being an impulsive, arrogant asshole in season one, and at the start of season two for that matter, was kind of the point. The point of her arc is that she grows out of that. His critiques of Korra as a character really miss the point of her arc, and he never explains in depth why he thinks this. He just thinks he's being cool and edgy by calling her a cunt every now and again. His next point is that The Legend of Korra is bad because it's an unnecessary sequel and it's pandering, so therefore it's bad. As an analogy to explain why this is so fucking stupid, uh, we didn't need Shrek 2, you know, you didn't need it to tell the story of Shrek 1, but it's still a good film. This is a bad take, since most sequels are inherently unnecessary. He makes more terrible comparisons to The Last Airbender, he takes some more direct jabs at Bright, which to me seems pretty disrespectful. Remember, the writing, not the writers. And at the end of the video, he essentially says that if you like the show, you're like, retarded, and he spends the last four minutes making fun of Korasami and the people who liked it. In fact, he actually did a whole video on this that I couldn't be fucked to watch, because I really don't care. Uh, hell, I watched all of these videos on, on two times speed, because I, I could only tolerate so much fucking stupid. In part three, he hinted at the fact that he would be deconstructing the rest of the show, yet he never does so beyond some text on screen. All of his problems with Korra, the show, and the character stem from season one, and to me, that's a little disingenuous. You can't call the whole show garbage when you only explain why you thought so for the first season. I don't know if he reviewed the other three seasons or not, but if he did and it's more nitpicking garbage like this, I'm, I'm not watching it. Oh, oh, but Matt, 
happened, man? You're going too hard on him. Oh, maybe his opinion has changed since then. Oh. No, I'm not. And no, he hasn't. When the last Airbender dropped on Netflix in the States not too long ago and Legend of Korra debate started popping up again, you better fucking believe ER was all up in that. People were framing this tweet like it was some kind of gotcha, but like, it, it, it's not. Like, bro, Netflix didn't make the show. And even if they did, the show's ratings have zero bearing on its quality. That's a fucking brain dead take if he meant it seriously. So he hasn't changed, I doubt he's attempted to change, and I don't feel bad for anybody who wants to go hard in the paint on him and his flawed arguments. At the end of the day, ER's Legend of Horror series has a few good points throughout, but none of them are things that ruin the entire show. They're minor issues that you should be able to look past, that any rational person would see and go, eh, that was kind of weird, but fuck it. Look past it. ER and Lily Orchard have created terrible standards for what qualifies as criticism of The Legend of Korra because most of their videos are nitpicks that don't actually impact the quality of the show and their own misinterpretations of the characters and story. I've talked about this before in an Internet Idiocracy episode, but when videos like these get popular, people stop thinking for themselves. They just take the critiques that they hear in these kinds of videos and hold those opinions as their own. If you read the comments on any of these videos, you'll find people who either didn't watch the show in its entirety and therefore shouldn't have an opinion on it, or people who watched the show, didn't like it, didn't know why they didn't like it, and just used somebody else's flawed reasoning to validate their own opinions. These two ruined Legend of Korra discourse with their points, however valid or invalid they may be, copy and paste it around the internet by people who were mad that they didn't get that avatar all grown up that they wanted. Motherfuckers think they're so goddamn smart because they watched the same two videos on my Legend of Korra was a travesty, but that doesn't, that doesn't make you smart. That makes you a follower, that makes you a sheep. I would not have a problem with these videos if they just said periodically throughout their videos things that remind the audience that it's just their opinion, but they don't. They tout their opinions as gospel and people take it as gospel. And just as a reminder so people don't use that point against me, most of this video was factual with evidence and shit from, from the show, and when I did give my opinion, I made sure you fucking knew it. I don't have anything against these people personally, so don't go like attack them or anything, I just think that they've created a terrible environment online for discussing this show. You know, you're not, you're not allowed to say anything positive about it without some self-righteous motherfuckers sending you to these videos or regurgitating their flawed talking points. I can't even listen to the OST for this fucking show without these motherfuckers and their stupid fucking garbage videos showing up on my recommended. Fuck both of you. But enough of that, Daddy CMG needs to calm down. Let's go take a look at some at some YouTube comments because everybody knows that YouTube comments are the best place for valid criticism. How we doing, honkies? Clean shaven Matt CMG here. I, I totally didn't get a haircut in the middle of the video. What, do you, what are you guys talking about? Was, you, fuck you. As Bearded Matt just told you, we're gonna be look, going through my comment section and t looking at some of the terrible comments that are masked under the guise of criticism, when in reality that's just a bunch of people who didn't fucking get it or are too stupid to actually differentiate it opinion and fact. So let's 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 get into this. Let's get some let's find some dumb ones. The thing about a lot of the comments we're going to we're going to be looking at here is uh I have a fucking addiction to responding to comments, especially when I see ones that are so unbelievably dumb. Like this guy here, right? He goes, "I don't like that Korra gets her bending back at the end of season 1." Okay, fair enough. She also just gets the avatar state and she gets energy bending, so all of Amon's actions had no consequences. Uh, no, they had consequences. The consequences of Amon's actions were the fact that Korra lost her bending in the first place and was on the verge of probably suicide. Uh, you could probably interpret that scene as looking at it that way. I don't know that that was intentional because she's she's lost her her entire identity that was based around bending. That's a, that's a that's a consequence, and the fact that Ang gives that back to her in, is, in, if anything, a positive consequence because it ends up being important in season uh, season two. You have finally connected with your spiritual self. Oh, here's one. Here we got we got we got some gold right here. First of all, I love all those videos that you've shown, and I still think Korra isn't that interesting to me. That that line is stupid. Why would you Why would you take videos like ERs and like Lily Orchard seriously? As I've just proven, they are terrible videos. So I, I anybody who immediately says, "Oh, I, I trust I trust those 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 people and their and their views." I, I immediately don't take them seriously because those videos are fucking garbage. Oh, here we got another one. Here we got one of my major problems with her airbending snap is that her air, big airbending moment is a punch. She learns to overcome her stubbornness and impatience with a demonstration of power out of frustration. It wasn't out of frustration; it was out of desperation. But anyway, go off. I didn't. I didn't go nearly as in depth into why I don't like this as I'd like, but it's 2 a.m. Not really. In other words, uh, I couldn't be bothered to explain why I think this is bad. I'm just gonna tell you that this is bad and uh, not explain why. Oh, here we got another one. Look, the person who made Legend of Korra is garbage and here's why I expect his, not to be a, not to be an SJW or anything, but nice, nice misgendering there. I'm pretty sure Lily Orchard is trans, but 
Anyways, in a nitpicky way and really craps on Cora in general. No show is perfect, not even at not even the last airbender, which is which is fair, that's true. No, no show is perfect. Not even the last airbender, not even breaking bad. No no show is perfect. But he makes really which I'm gonna say she, because that's the correct way. But she makes really good points. Except she doesn't. She makes some terrible fucking points. Go watch the Admiral's analysis. Boom, somewhere up one of these corners. And if you read the comments on that video, you see people acknowledging those points and agreeing, though still liking the show. She was okay with that. After all, you shouldn't bash people. No, if that's what you if that's what you saw when you read her comment section, then you didn't read her comment section. Because if you go to her comment section, she actually has every comment held for review. So she literally picks and chooses which comments go public. And the ones that actually disprove her and prove her incorrect, you'll never see them. You never see those comments because she handpicks them. What is it? Again, Admiral, the Admiral's analysis proved that in his video. So go again, go watch that. Honestly, I believe that half, if not most, of the critiques that could be made about Korra herself and the, her character arc wouldn't be anywhere near as easily attributed to a male protagonist. Yeah, I'm pulling the sexism card. I mean, I won't deny that that like. There is some sort of, like, subconscious sexism in regards to this, but I don't think that everybody who hates Korra is a sexist. That's kind of a dumb fucking take. Oh, here's a, here's one of my favorites. This guy just goes, shit. Nice, nice criticism, buddy. I really, really like the point. I really like the part where you uh, proved me wrong. Here's a guy who really missed the point here, right? He goes, the fact that Korra believes that physical fighting is what makes you an avatar with just the bending is the reason why I despise her so much. I hate people who think that just because they have something to fight with, they think that they just need that thing to fight with no thoughts or information to use in a fight. Like how person thinks that as long as you have a gun, you will be fine and having have a winning fighting, but will use of that gun. Will, I'm having a fucking stroke reading this. I'm sorry. The person holds the gun is just as dangerous as the gun itself. The person has a gun, but the enemy is hiding behind something. The gun wielder has knowledge of mathematics and geometry and applies his knowledge of those things with the gun, allowing the gun to bounce off surfaces to hit an You realize that's not real, right? This isn't the game. This isn't my friend Pedro. You know that fucking game where you could bounce the fucking bullets off the frying pan? This isn't a fucking video game, buddy. That's not how bullets work. Anyways. Information is the greatest power anyone can possess. Considering how Korra thinks and acts in this category is the reason why I don't like Korra. In other words, what this guy is basically saying is, uh, I don't like Korra because I disagreed with her at first. Even though she's not even like that for the remainder of the series, she's only like that in really season one. I, I, I'm pretty sure I explained to this guy in this in the you know 20 fucking replies that we exchanged that we had. This was a long time ago, almost a year ago when this video first came out. But what this guy is basically saying is he, I don't agree with Korra's initial mindset, which you're supposed to disagree with, you're supposed to see that it's flawed, which she is supposed to realize that it's flawed at the first season, and he doesn't like her the entire series because of that specific initial mindset, without even acknowledging the fact that she is literally supposed to change. I, I don't understand. Korra is bad because they had to retcon the last Airbender to make it work. No, they didn't. They retconned it to add lore, but it didn't. It didn't. It could. It could have worked without doing that. Ang is supposedly a genius bender at his age. So is Korra supposedly more of a genius? Yes. There are more examples, but I'm going going to list it all here. I'm not saying the themes of the show aren't good, but it feels like fan fiction. See, that's another argument that I don't understand. Is when people are like, "Oh, the Legend of Korra." It seems like fan fiction. It's, it's, it's all fan fiction. I don't understand that fucking argument because one, there can be good fan fiction. I don't understand why this, there's this, this notion that fan fiction is inherently bad. I mean, I personally don't read fan fiction. I don't give a fuck. But there's just some kind of there's this mindset that fan fiction is just inherently bad when that's not necessarily true. And two, it implies that. Uh, this isn't actually canon. I'm not going to accept that this show is canon because specifically this it feels like fan fiction Therefore it is fan fiction, which is fucking stupid. Mike and Brian did it. It's canon. Deal with it fucker The videos against Korra aren't closing a dialogue It's just showing their side and even talk to people in the comments saying they aren't as black No, that's not what it is because they literally watch their videos They present their 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 views as fact and that's not at all true because they misunderstand the show in a every fucking conceivable way. Regardless, it still won't fix how much of a dumpster fire wasted potential Korra was. It's already been done to death anyways, why it's bad. In other words, I'm not gonna tell you why I personally think it's bad or why I personally didn't like the show. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that everybody else has already proven it, even though they fucking haven't. Suck me. I think you're wrong on those reviews. It is important to eviscerate things that try to ruin your childhood. <laughs> You gotta be kidding me! It tries to, tries to ruin your child. That's the fucking dumbest take I have ever fucking heard. Why in the fuck would the people who made the original fucking show also take their sequel and go, yeah, we're gonna take this, this new thing and we're gonna make it ruin the old thing. What the fuck kind of logic does that, you're, you're making it out like they're intentionally fucking 
trying to uh, ruin The Last Airbender when not only is that fucking retarded, but that's also not how that works. Oh, here we go. We got a good one. We got us a good one, boys. Korra, a whiny bitch who has everything handed to her, but the show doesn't even acknowledge this. It actually does acknowledge this. Literally watch the very first episode and you'll see that she's literally like a fish out of water in Republic City because she's been locked away in a fucking, in the South Pole for years. You think she has any fucking social skills? You think she any understands how this works? She doesn't understand it. She's obviously a narcissist in the beginning, and she learns to obviously overcome that. You didn't watch the fucking show. This is this is another case of taking the character at the beginning and assuming that's the entire character throughout the entire show, when that's not the fucking point. Mako, a hot orphan for Korra to want to cheat on, who then gets blamed for cheating, even though Korra was the one who kissed him. Watch that. Watch that entire episode again. None of them are seen as being in the right for doing anything that they did. Korra is not seen as in the right for kissing Mako, even though she. She shouldn't have and Mako is not seen as in the right for you know kissing her back when he was dating Asami. Pa none of the parties involved are seen as good. Bolin, all the comic relief of Sokka minus the stuff that made him badass. If you thought Sokka being a badass was all there was to his character you're, you're sorely mistaken. Sokka is a character who deals immensely with his own insecurities and and overcoming them and learning to be a more confident human. Asami, a hot girl who barely even speaks until the dick directors figure she can be relevant. You don't understand how TV works because that's not what the fucking director does. But okay. Who then apparently lesbians for Korra in an extremely unsatisfying and nonsensical thing right at the end of the show. Yeah, it's so nonsensical that gay people exist. Ooh, ooh, I'm so fucking scared. Fuck you, cunt. Oman, a seemingly interesting character who then gets the coolness washed out of him with his stupid, oh, he was actually a little, little bender the whole time. Also, it looks like the writers, in order to continue the murica that they unnaturally ejected into the show, attempted to do a crap job of summing up communism. Okay, even if Aman was meant to represent communism, which he isn't because he's more of a social egalitarian if anything else. How the fuck does him being a communist have anything to do with the show being Americanized, which it isn't. The only aspects in which the show is Americanized is Republic City itself being like a melting pot, much like New York was in the in the 20s, and the fact that it has the Ang statue, which is a pretty on-the-nose reference to the Statue of Liberty. That's really the only Americanized influences there, and obviously the, the, the democracy kind of thing, but democracy was a thing way before America. Tarlock, we do not speak of this season. No one needed to know the origin of the Avatar that's totally not just God and Satan philosophy. Somebody watched the Lily Orchard video and didn't actually listen to the fucking show. The Red Lotus, wanted anarchy, which is just a power vacuum for dictatorship and capitalism. That's the point, dickhead. Kuvira, okay, except for the whole giant robot thing. Why is the giant fucking mech suit so difficult to understand? If the Fire Nation can make a giant fucking drill, do you really think it's that out of the fucking blue that they can make a metal bending powered fucking mech suit. I don't see why that's so fucking hard for people to get. Also, since when did everybody get into the into three-dimensional characters? Sauron, Darth Vader, Fire Lord Ozai, all of these guys are objectively two-dimensional, yet Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and The Last Airbender are amazing. We don't need the villains to be a gray area because the story is not about the villain. What? This motherfucker just said Darth Vader is a two-dimensional villain. Darth Vader is one of the more three-dimensional villains ever. Vader is constantly is constantly torn between the light and the dark, much like Luke is. Um, and especially if you look into the prequels, Anakin, who eventually becomes Vader, obviously, is a, is a very nuanced character. Fire Lord Ozai, he is very two-dimensional, but just because some TV shows and movies have two-dimensional villains doesn't mean that three-dimensional villains are inherently fucking worse. That's retarded. Republic City. Hey, remember how cool, wondrous, and imaginative the world of The Last Airbender was? Hey, let's do that, but infuse it with America! Steampunk! Cars! Radios! Doesn't matter if technology couldn't have gone that far, especially during peacetime! Also, remember how much of an intimate spiritual thing bending was? Forget that, let's have bending Quidditch! Well, I, pr I already disproved half of this guy's points in, uh, earlier in the video. What, the, the one thing that he got me was fucking when he called it steampunk. The Legend of uh, Republic City isn't really steampunk. It's, it's more, it's, the, it's literally just 1920s. That's not steampunk. Steampunk was never really a thing that existed in real life. Steampunk is a, is a concept. Doesn't matter if te technology couldn't have gone that far, especially during peacetime, except it could have, because uh, look at the Industrial Revolution. We, ha we got everything that they had in Korra and more in less time than when it was between The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra. The end of Last Airbender and the start of Legend of Korra is 70 years. And in, in real life, the Industrial Revolution was a course of like 50 some odd years. It wasn't, it, we, we, we had more technology in less time in the real world than they did in the actual show. If anything, that's more realistic. Another idea, Korasami, we know that all of our children fans of The Last Airbender secretly wanted lesbians 
And to top it off, we can get away with getting our rainbow points, even though we did it at the very last minute of the very last episode of the show, and there was no chemistry at all. If you think there's no chemistry, you didn't watch the show. If you thought they were doing it just for rainbow points, just to just appease the LGBT community, uh, you're also fucking wrong, because that happened in 2014. It was obviously written and animated way back in probably 2013. That was, that, that kind of shit didn't really pop off yet. That shit was not at the mainstream yet. LGBT representation was not a huge thing. If anything, Korosami was one of the first LGBT couples in animation, in Western animation at the time. And, wh and why is this Why is this a children's thing? You, children can understand what gay people are. I don't, I don't understand what the fucking point is. Best of all, the show is mature! Here's a list of the things that were so childish in The Last Airbender. He lists a whole bunch of, he lists a whole bunch of bullshit with about, about the, all the conspiracies and stuff and Fa Sing Se. When people say that Korra was mature, they're not saying that The Last Airbender wasn't mature. I don't understand that fucking logic. That's a huge leap in logic. Legend of Korra was a mature show, but in a different way from The Last Airbender. The Last Airbender just did it a lot more subtly. Nobody is saying it's a kid's show and that it's childish. So this guy goes, yeah, she should have changed from that. She should have, but she didn't. But obviously this guy didn't watch the fucking video or the show for that matter because she did change and it's very fucking obvious with evidence and examples. I proved it in this video and last year's video. Guy's a fucking retard. You mean the raging part? She didn't change where there were so many chances for the writers to actually change her, but they didn't. It's one of the things that made the show so bad and such a flop. Motherfucker, what? I don't know how you could watch this show and not see her change, but okay, I already proved that in the video. She raged, she lost the battle just like any other ones because she thought controlling the four elements is being the avatar like in the start. She still jumps to conclusions, doesn't know how her actions have influence on others, so no, I don't see any change. Past season one, her her her, her whole thing is no longer, I'm, I'm the avatar because I can bend all the elements. That's not a thing anymore past season one. If in season two, it's more of the avatar state though. She has that a similar mindset, but with the avatar state. And in seasons three and four, she is way past that. I don't know how the fuck you could possibly think that she is. So I explained to him, obviously, I explained to this guy in a, in, a, in a comment, like, okay, this is why you're wrong. I explained it to him with, uh, with facts and evidence, of course. And he goes, with all of this text, you just confirmed that she didn't change because you said I was right with every one of those and means she didn't change the writers made the series suck. So in other words, I explained to you in vivid detail how she did in fact change and you go, no, she didn't change because you wrote a lot of text on the screen. You're fucking dumb. Motherfucker, what? The writers made the series suck. Are you are you implying that they doing it there? They made it suck intentionally because that's fucking stupid and retarded, and that wouldn't make any sense. And maybe if it would play in the same universe as the last Airbender, the show would have gotten less criticism. See, that's another thing I always see. They're like, oh, it would have been a good show if it wasn't connected to the last Airbender, but like, it wouldn't have worked if it wasn't. So I don't fucking understand that that logic. You write all these points. She should have changed, but in the end, she didn't. She should not get mad so easy. She's the avatar. She carries the burden and a hard one. But in this start till the last episode, she made the same mistakes over and over, all because she didn't know any better. She doesn't, though. What the fuck are you talking about? Yo, kid, calm down about a bad show. You didn't watch The Last Airbender. If you did know stuff in Korra wasn't right, now calm down. Like I said, I'm not gonna further argue in YouTube comments. If you want to add me on Discord, fuck this guy. I'm gonna blank out of Discord just because I want to bully him, but... <laughs> now, now, this motherfucker is implying that I have never seen The Last Airbender. Motherfucker, I've seen this show since I was fucking five years old. I've watched it every year since I was a fucking child. Alright, you mother- you wanna- you wanna call- you wanna call me out for that? Fuck you. Uh, good one. You can make a hundred videos saying you like it and sum- sum- summon up what happened and you should have happened. But if you watch The Legend of Korra and you want to place it in the universe that was created from The Last Airbender, you'll see it won't fit. You can make such excuses for Korra as you want. Fact is, Aang is the, and said Sky Bison. Here we go. Here's some more bringing up the uh, irrelevant bullshit that nobody asked for. We see this a lot in a lot of these kinds of comments. This guy's talking about like, okay, here's here's why you're wrong. But then also I'm going to bring up this irrelevant thing that you didn't, we weren't actually discussing. We're going to talk about, you know, we're talking about, uh, here's here's your here's my opinion on the show. I think it sucks. But also the Sky Bison here are, are with a, original airbenders. Motherfucker, what? He goes, look, I really dislike the series because it took so much potential, so much operations, and it did nothing with it. The bending is ruined. A left hook is now earth, water, air, and fire bending. In the last airbender, that was explained to not work because for earth- No, that was never explained to work. You could use bending in any fucking way in the last airbender. Tough, tough, you would earth bend all the fucking time just by stomping her fucking foot. How is that any different from throwing a fucking punch and fire bending? It doesn't make any fucking sense. What you what did that moron say you should try to stand a little more loose in the last airbender? It was made clear that the first airbenders were sky bison, etc. Only water bending was ever really confirmed. It never was confirmed, actually. They never explained. See, again, I already explained this, but the common misconception is people say, when they say in the last airbender, oh, I got earth bending from the badger moles, or we got air we learned air bending from the sky bison. They're not saying that they obtained the ability from them, because that's fucking dumb. If that were the case, 
then Sokka, why doesn't Sokka look at the fucking moon and just become a waterbender? It doesn't work like that. They got the abilities from the lion turtles and they learned how to turn it into a martial art by watching the animals. I loved the mystery about how the avatar was created and I was so hyped when I heard the story gets explained in Korra and when I watched it I thought it was a parody because it was so cliche. How is it cliche though? Please explain, fucko. The story of Korra was weird. It was different from the last airbender and I liked that it was just the same over and over, but Kor Korra's storyline was not good. The side characters were actually boring. I didn't see them grow with the story like like they were always just there once the moron did some awesome This guy's Ron's sentences are making me want to fucking hang myself. Here we have a comment from a completely unrelated video where he goes, I haven't started yet, but if there's any mention to how good Korra is, oh, I hate that show. <laughs> I think The Legend of Korra is way better than The Last Airbender. Bad take. I'd say that's a lukewarm take, but okay. So you're one of those. It's not a bad take just because I don't share your opinion. Bad take, bigot, butt hurt. I'm not offended. <laughs> this is a fucking dumb exchange. Here we go. Gr Grand Admiral Thrawn re writes, LMAO, Korra is a horrible character, a horrible avatar, and a horrible girlfriend. Let's begin with this. She is a lesbian, and it's a kid's show. LMAO. It's not a kid's show, but okay. And she literally dated her team. Okay, what's wrong with that? Aang dated his team, technically. He dated Katara after after the series, of course, but it, it's I don't see why that's a problem. Zuko dated Mei while they were a team. I don't see why that's a problem. Also, let's, let's see the characters and the villains. Three benders and a non-bender. Two siblings, psychopath villains, villains who want to rule the world, two pets in the avatar team. Hmm, I think I've seen those things before. Oh yeah, Aang. This is a terrible fucking comparison because that's that's actually stupid. What did you what, what the fuck did you want the Legend of Korra to do? Oh, let's have a whole non-bender team. No, you fucking idiot. You're gonna have to have different team members of different elements. I don't I don't understand why that that's a a problem. It's not a problem. They're not ripping off the last airbender just because they have an earthbender on the team and they have a firebender on the team. That's fucking dumb. Also, Korra was a Mary Sue. She was four and she could bend water, earth, and fire. Fire! The opposite natural of her main. It's actually explained in the show and I think even in the last airbender that the it's not the element that's opposite to their natural element. It's the element that's opposite to their personality. Aang was obviously a natural. He was an airbender but he had the airbender mindset which is why he couldn't bend earth. It was the oppo it was so opposite to the airbender mindset that he learned from the monks. Korra was a very brash and, and reactionary person, and she couldn't she wasn't very free. She was very mentally restricted. She was fearing Amon during the whole the whole season. That's very opposite to her personality. Airbending is about being free. She couldn't be free because she was fucked in the head. I already explained this again in a different in this video and and the other one. She beated four different villains in each book, and it took Aang three books just to defeat Ozai and bend all elements. Not even master them. Not even gonna talk about the biggest plot hole ever. Zuko's daughter? What? Zuko and Mei broke up in the comics. Just because they broke up in the comics doesn't mean Zuko can't have fucking kids, you dumbass. That's not even a plot, that's not a plot hole, that's just you being a fucking dumbass. She beat four different villains in each book. Now she beat one villain in each book, but okay. I don't see how that's any different from Aang beating a as many people as he does in The Last Airbender, but okay. I want to ignore this fact, but I can't. The Chi Blockers. God, they destroyed Chi Blockers. Why? By making them more common? What the fuck is that? I don't see what the problem is with that. Two fucking Chi Blockers couldn't get Korra and Mako. They were punching them and they could still bend. It took Ty Lee just one punch to just win, which isn't actually true. It took her a few punches. It takes her a few. But yeah, the plot armor is really strong. Also, Korra is a Mary Sue, so he never actually explained how she was a Mary Sue. He's made up all this bullshit that isn't actually true. Anyways, it's time for my favorite. The point of season three was really dumb and cheap. Although I really liked the Red Lotus, the point, uh, really dude? Just because a dark spirit was destroyed, it gave random people the ability to airbend? Really? That's just a cheap excuse to bring back airbenders. God! In other words, I can't under I can't rationalize the magic, so therefore I will not accept the magic. Fuck you, that's dumb. Something else I hate about Korra is that they destroyed Aang's character. When Kaya and Bumi said that Aang only cared about Tenzin, Jesus, what? Aang would never but ever love one of his kids more than the other. I explained this in a video uh, a couple weeks ago, but this is actually not the case. This is a huge misconception. Just because Bumi and Kaya felt that they were neglected by Aang doesn't mean that they actually were. What is it? Watch the Avatar Hot Takes video or whatever, the Unpopular Opinions video. Korra, Korra sucked, sucks, and will forever suck. Korra makes the last Airbender movie look good. Ooh! Ooh! That's a bad take, buddy! So, you dislike these videos because they don't share your opinion. Very epic. No, motherfucker. I dislike those videos because they're fucking garbage and they don't explain themselves well at all. Okay, so, Shrek is the best franchise and it tops anything, says. Who said Korra is a bad character? Uh, a lot of people, actually. The reasons why The Legend of Korra sucks is that it tries too hard to be epic. What? What the fuck does that even mean? Tries too hard to be epic. What does that mean? New antagonists every season, which basically tells you they didn't plan through. Well, while it's true that they didn't 100% plan everything through from the very beginning, like they did with The Last Airbender, they still had planning. 
And the last Airbender also had seasonal villains. They had a new, they had a new antagonist every season. Season one it was Zhao. Season two it was Azula. And season three it was a mix of Azula and uh, Ozai. Amon should have been the main antagonist of the entire show. That's a that's personal, I guess. Korra shouldn't be able to bend three elements at that age. Why the fuck can't she? Why not? Literally, why can't she? I've never heard anybody give me an actual valid reason for why she actually can't or shouldn't be able to do that. It's, it's not a rule. Don't even bother replying, it's pointless to try and change my mind. In other words, I'm right and I refuse to hear anybody telling me it's wrong. So, this comment comes from a, 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 a fellow named Bruce Wayne, and this was not even on my Korra video. This comment was left on my, my, my Avatar Inspirations video, the one where I talk about the, the fighting styles and stuff. Th that you accept Korra makes me really sad. Bruh. In other words, I can't fathom the fact that somebody likes The Legend of Korra and I don't. Oh, boo-hoo. Of course, I'm like, Legend of Korra is good, people just don't use their brains, you know, people don't actually think about the show so they, they just see that it's garbage. But it's not. I have a video defending the series, specifically Korra herself, so I recommend you watch it. Which is completely innocuous. This is a completely innocuous statement. I just, I recommend the guy go see my, my Korra is a good character video. Which is perfectly fine, right? Perfectly innocuous. I didn't offend the guy. I didn't insult the guy. I didn't threaten him. I didn't do anything. I just said perfectly, a perfectly innocuous thing I recommend on my video. But then, then he responds, sure, after you offended me, I will go watch your video. By the way, there are so many videos about this. Okay, two problems here. Uh, one, how, I don't know how you were offended by such an innocuous statement. I like how you took uh, a, a completely innocuous recommendation and turned it into an insult that literally not one person made. And he also goes, there are so many videos about this, implying that he can't actually think for himself. He just, he needs YouTube videos to tell him why the show is bad. Why do you keep writing? Are you so insecure that you need to argue against me because I don't want to watch your video? Are you okay, bro? I literally just want to, I, I recommended him the video and I want to explain to him why he's wrong. I have, a, I do have a bit of an addiction. Uh, to responding to comments and, and proving people wrong because I feel I feel immense Satisfaction from proving people wrong. It's actually a, probably a, a, a fucking problem I watched a lot of videos that defended and criticized the Legend of Korra and my final statement is that the Legend of Korra would be Okay, if the last airbender wouldn't exist, but it does I still don't understand that fucking mindset But okay, but by saying that people just don't use their brains You imply that everyone who doesn't share your opinion is stupid It has nothing to do with my opinion It has to do with the fact that the show is objectively good and that anybody who doesn't think so is actually wrong So I respond of course I go into into detail, it's nothing that I haven't already said before. I watched it, and the worst thing about it is the setting. It moved from Eastern culture to the West with its capitalism. It feels like after Avatar The Last Airbender American version, and that just sucks. The plot is just garbage, and Korra is just some angry kid. Alright, I proved uh, two of those wrong already in the video, but uh, it, it didn't, it, it never moved to Western culture, and there's literally zero uh, indication that there was ever capitalism. In, in the show, ever, at all. Here we go, some more in, uh, stuff that nobody asked for. The point is that Korra doesn't change over the seasons, and then the enemies. None of it have any relatable or reasonable motivation. I don't know how you could watch that show and have most of the characters literally spell out your, their fucking motivations for you, many of which are somewhat relatable, and go, they had no motivations, which leads me to believe that this guy didn't actually even watch the show. Just because you didn't get it doesn't mean it isn't there. Then bending is kind of useless. When they used it for the all day stuff in the last Airbender, opening gates, which they still do in The Legend of Korra, by the way. In Korra, they have electricity. It just doesn't work. How does it not work? What is that? I don't understand. <laughs> oh, oh no, they have electricity. I can't watch this fucking garbage. Are you kidding me? That's such a dumb fucking reason to hate the show. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody needs bending. What is the core of the series? Bending was never the core of The Last Airbender. The core of The Last Airbender was always the characters and the story. It had nothing to do with bending necessarily. You could replace the bending in The Last Airbender with any other kind of magic and it would probably have worked just the same. Obviously, you have to change a few things. People still do need bending in The Legend of Korra, though. That's, in fact, that's a that's a major uh, plot point in Season 1, is the fact that benders have a lot more, uh, you know, job opportunities and stuff like that by virtue of being benders. That's kind of the point of Hiroshi, uh, Hiroshi Sato making those mecha tanks in Season 1, was to prove that benders can, or non-benders can do anything that a bender can, which... You would have known if you watched the show, but I'm guessing that you didn't. Then the most stupid characters I have ever seen, like Marco. He didn't watch the show because he didn't know how to spell his fucking name. He is just the love interest. He has no character or grow in any way. He does actually. He's a very, he's a very hot, he's, he's hot headed at first, but he learns to be cool in intense situations. He's, uh, he's very protective of his brother. Very motivated. He's very, he's, he's he, there's a lot of, there's a lot of character to him. And to, to say that he doesn't have any character, I think is disingenuous at best. Again, I already talked about it in this video. Bolin is just the weird bad version of Sokka. See, people keep saying this, but they're, they're 
really only comparable in the sense that they're the funny guy. That's really the only comparison you could possibly make between the two. That Korra becomes bi at the end is also such a terrible move. Like, they wanted the attention of the LGBTQ by showing how open they are, but at the same second they don't have the balls to really go for it. The show was just bad. None of those things actually proved anything that the show was bad, but, uh, because you were actually phys objectively wrong on most of them, but okay. So I respond to him, you know, big long comment. Amon is there to represent communism, but just wants Stalinism. Typical American bullshit. How is that American bullshit? Communism was always has always been feared in America. What the fuck are you talking about? Does the Red Scare ring a bell to you, motherfucker? And uh, again, another mis misconception. Amon isn't a communist. He, if anything, is a social egalitarianist, but nobody's gonna bother with that, because equality equals communism. Our bending. Unalak is just totally random with no reason at all to do that. He does have a reason. He's power hungry. I will admit, the show does retcon uh, itself. Later on in season four, they make it so Unalak really just wanted to uh, unify humans and spirits, but he got power hungry and went all fucking crazy. Season two didn't really demonstrate that very well, which is I think why a lot of people don't like season two. But the fact that implying that he has no reason to do what he's doing at all is actually fucking stupid. Zaheer wants anarchy, which is just the dumbest way to run a state. Somebody watched Lily Orchard and didn't actually think for themselves. And Kuvira is basically a dictator like Hitler. Yeah, that's that's the point. She's showing the problems with military dictatorships. I don't- Korra is just some random teen with no wisdom, real power, under anything else. Are you, are you fucking slow? Are you dumb? No wisdom? She has no- you're right, she's not very wise at first. But if you watch the actual show, like season three onward, she is much wiser than she was in, in season one. It's, it's like, it's a fucking night and day comparison. I don't know how you could watch the show and say she didn't change, but okay. This part pissed me off, right? This geek, this guy goes, the only thing is that sad, puzzled emo kids can relate to her like, wow, she has gone through so much, which is basically just a bad way to design a character. The other ones are just not remarkable enough. This is, this, this part actually pissed me off because now you're, you're making it out to be that they made the character with the intent of, of, you know, targeting a specific demographic, which they didn't do. They made the character because they made the character. They didn't make it to appeal to a specific demographic. You're also severely downplaying her struggles in the show by just claiming that it was only there to appease the fucking emo kids, which is so fucking disingenuous, it's actually fucking painful. And then here we go, continue- this else, this also pissed me off. I mean, I get it, you want to be special and defend your series, but I think even you know that it's trash, and you can't just argument that it's not that bad, was still bad. I never said it's not that bad. I'm literally saying it's a good show. It's a, it is a good show with major flaws. Korra included is just some angry teen. No good story and doesn't add something good to the world of Avatar. It adds a shit ton to the world of Avatar. A shit ton of good shit. The villains are all are all random and kind of flat and seeing Korra get tortured is not deep. It's just awful to watch. I mean, yeah, the show never had potential because of no money and no good times at the TV and so on and so on, but that doesn't change the fact that it's trash. This is the actual dumbest fucking comment I think he's ever actually left because Several reasons. Saying it has no good story implies that you were literally look going into it with the uh, with the mindset of this is going to be bad. You know, if you go looking for trouble, you're going to find it. You know, I think it's, as I, as Iroh once said, if you look for the light, you can often find it. But if you look for the dark, that is all you will ever see. The villains are all random, which we already established isn't because you established in your previous comment that you knew what they were meant to represent. But, uh, they're all, they're all random. They're not random. They're actually, like, Zaheer and Kuvira specifically are made to complement each other. And seeing Korra get tortured is not deep. It's just awful to watch. It's not that it's deep. It's that it, it's, it's showing her true struggle that she's, that she's having. It's important to see how she struggles and how she suffers to, to truly s sympathize with her when, when she finally heals herself at the end of the series. I know I was in a pretty dark place after I was poisoned, but I finally understand why I had to go through all that. I needed to understand what true suffering was, so I could become more compassionate to others. So I respond again, of course, with actual, you know, logic and reasoning. I'm tired of you not arguing and just saying your opinion over and over. It's kind of sad how you try so hard to defend the objective point that the series is not good compared to anything else except itself. Shows how terrible sh the show even is. So, whatever lets you sleep at night. He's not even reading what I'm saying because I'm actually giving him facts and evidence from the show if you go and read the comment. He's just, he's just assuming that I'm giving my opinion, which I'm not doing. If I were giving my opinion, I would say, oh, I like this character, uh, I like the way this character was written. It's fucking stupid. With this guy, and I think a lot of other uh, comments like these fail to understand is that liking and connecting with a character don't immediately mean that the character is well written. And same thing goes vice versa. If you didn't like or didn't connect with a character, that doesn't mean that they were poorly written. I don't understand that fucking logic at all. Again, though, just because you didn't get it doesn't mean it's not there. Haha, <laughs> I just went to your channel and saw your face. Why the hell 
was I listening to you in the first place? Haha, <laughs> laughing emoji. See, that's how you know he's lost, because he's using the laughing emoji, and he's going for the, the old ad hominem. You immediately know that you've won the argument when they go for the ad hominem. By the way, comparison is the only way to see how good or bad something is. It's it's not, but okay. Uh, no, you can look at something in a vacuum. You don't need to compare it to other things to see how good or bad it is. This this comment, and I think one of the one of his other ones, proves proves to me that he didn't actually read what I was saying and doesn't actually care to. He goes, oh, I'm sorry for not going all deep in the comments for some random video. By the way, Schopenhauer said in The Art of Being Right that being impolite is actually a big part of a discussion. I think this perfectly shows that this guy is a fucking huge pseudo-intellectual. Because he quotes Schopenhauer's uh, The Art of Being Right, which is literally satire on how stupid people win arguments against smart people by going for things like ad hominems and, and uh, you know, being impolite in, in arguments. It's, it's literally satire. It's telling you what not to do by showing somebody doing it. And there are objective rules that make good movies, characters, books, etc. Or things like the Emmys or critics in general would make no sense at all. There are objective rules to storytelling and character writing, which I've, again, used throughout this video, and Legend of Korra follows pretty fucking closely. He also brings up things like the Emmys and critics, when meanwhile, this show has actually won Emmys. It's won awards, and it's universally praised by critics, for the most part, more or less. The point is that I broke all the villains down to what they present, and you're just saying, yeah, but they look cool, which proves to me that he never actually read my comment. Because he not only did he oversimplify the villains, which I already explained earlier in the video, he also assumes that I just said, I like them because they look cool, which I never fucking said. I literally explained why they, why their philosophies uh, are there, why, they, why they're made, written the way that they're written. But he, 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 he assumes that I'm just saying they look cool from a design standpoint. Okay, I will not read this. This is way too long and you will just say the same things over and over like you did before. You have no arguments than your own opinion, so have fun, I guess. Which, again, proves to me that he didn't read what I was saying. He doesn't care to argue. He just wants to live in his own little fucking hate bubble without actually acknowledging the other side. Again, it shows the pattern. There's a lot of refusal to see the other side. To see what the, what the why the show is actually good. You pointing out nothing. You just telling your opinion why you like the show. Even it's trash. And I will not read that novels you write. And I will also not read that shit. You just coming with the same blind, non-working arguments since your first comment. Again, he didn't read what I said. I proved him wrong, objectively speaking, in literally every comment that I left in this thread. And he's... Fuck this guy. Sure, now you get personal after telling me not to. I didn't get personal, but okay. You little fanboy with no arguments. I mean, keep watching the show. I don't care about you ever being virgin. It's compared with other show trash. Your arguments just work if there would be no other show ever made, but that's not the fact, so we both know you are wrong. Now, you know who's wrong, buddy? You. It's you. You didn't actually fucking uh, read what, I, what what anybody said. You're literally just a fucking stupid idiot. I'm, I, I'm actually convinced that these two accounts are his alts because he goes, Wow, you are totally right. The series is trash. I mean, Korra just doesn't work at all. It is such a terrible show. And then he responds to me. Keep, keep in mind, this account is Nietzsche says hi, which is the you know philosopher Nietzsche. You don't bring any arguments at all. If you go to this guy's current profile, his, his name used to be Bruce Wayne, but now he's... It's, I recently saw this comment again, and his name is now changed to Nietzsche says hi, which is the same as this account. Account, which means he was re literally responding to himself with alt accounts to try to make himself look more correct than he is, which he isn't. So fuck this guy, I'm a winner. That's enough ripping on these comments for today. Let's let's check back in with Bearded Matt. You, you guys you guys see the pattern here. There's an awful lot of straight up refusal to hear any reason for why the show is good. And that's the reason why videos like mine or any other defending the show get disliked to hell. Because these people don't actually want to listen to the arguments for why the show works. They just see Korra good, so they get mad and they leave dislikes. And based on some of the grammar that I've seen, these people clearly aren't very intelligent. Like, what the fuck is this? This is fucking unintelligible. Also notice that none of these people ever actually back up what they're saying or explain explain why they said what they said. You'll often see these people mention a critique, but then never explain how that makes the show bad. These are the types of people we're dealing with here. People who make these bold blanket statements without any actual reasoning for why they think this to be the case, and when asked for actual reasoning, they just repeat the same thing again with extra irrelevant bullshit that nobody actually asked for. And when somebody like me makes an actual effort to explain to these people that their hate is misguided with evidence and examples from the show, you're more or less ignored. We should have no reason to take people like this seriously. If you're gonna try to claim that the show is bad, then give valid examples from the show and explain why they make the show bad instead of just saying, it's bad because I said so and you're, you're an apologist. That's the difference between me and people like this. Even if I'm not correct, which is impossible because I'm always right, I at the very least provide valid evidence and ex specific examples to back up what I'm saying. These people don't do anything of the sort and they think that they know what they're talking about when they don't. Oh, and by the way, if you see somebody using a laughing emoji in an argument 
argument, that means that they've lost but refuse to accept defeat. When they use the cry laughing emoji, they are more angry than you could possibly fucking imagine. Do not give in to 10,000 years of darkness. You are the Avatar. have to find my own path as the Avatar. To close this video out, I would like to expand on something that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. At the, at the very start of this video, I said that it's okay to dislike The Legend of Korra, but it's not okay to claim the show is bad. In other words, more people should learn to differentiate their opinion on a show from the actual objective quality of the show. For example, The Last Airbender and Breaking Bad are, objectively speaking, two of the best shows ever made. But I guarantee you that there are people who don't like them. These people wouldn't be wrong for disliking these shows, since that's just their opinion, but they would be wrong to call those shows bad because they most certainly aren't. This same logic applies to any piece of media, The Legend of Korra included. You are totally free to dislike The Legend of Korra for whatever reason that isn't nitpicking. You know, maybe you didn't connect with the characters, maybe you didn't like certain story elements, maybe the themes just weren't for you. All of that is completely reasonable and is room for discussion, but what isn't reasonable is claiming the show to be terrible, garbage, worthless, or any other synonym for bad just because you didn't personally like it. The reason we have critics is because they can identify the things a piece of media did right or wrong from an objective standpoint, and they form their opinions based on that. Legend of Korra discourse, for whatever reason, is retardedly exempt from this rule, which in the Avatar fandom specifically shows a blatant bias against it. 99% of pointless arguments could be completely avoided if people just said, I don't like this, instead of this is bad. The former is an opinion and that should be respected. The latter is a statement that you should be required to back up with facts and evidence. At the end of the day, The Legend of Korra is not a perfect show. It's a series plagued by underutilized side characters, severe pacing issues, a lack of episodes, and a few rushed endings. However, for everything that it does wrong, it does twice as much right with its logically consistent stories, its use of world building, its great yet overlooked character arcs, its fleshed out villains with interesting and relatable motivations, and fantastically deep themes combined with beautiful animation and a moving soundtrack. You may not like The Legend of Korra for whatever reason you may have, you know, matter of preference I suppose, but to call it bad bad, garbage, trash, worthless, the worst show ever made, or worse than the fucking movie are exaggerations to the highest degree, and you fucking know it. It's not perfect, but I'll be goddamned if it isn't one of the best animated shows ever released. And I'm not saying that because I happen to like it, I'm saying that because it's true. And if you're even remotely intelligent, you saw exactly why throughout this video. I am sick of the hyperbolic slander against the show, and hopefully I put many of these flawed arguments to rest. And speaking of rest, I think it's time that I get some. This has been Avatar Month 2020, I hope you all enjoyed. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe for more. I've been Matt CMG. I'll see y'all next time. Thanks for watching.